Guess what? <laughs> Bob's not here yet. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to a uh, what I hope to be will be a fun comic art live show. But as of uh, this moment, Bob hasn't uh, gotten back with me today, and I've emailed him a few times. He got me his picture last week, late last week, but uh, so far, uh, he's not here. So uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on it. Shot him a couple extra emails just to see. Sent, check to see if he wasn't in one of the other rooms by accident, where I've sometimes sent people to the wrong place. But uh, but welcome one and all who have tuned in for this was going to be a great conversation. So we'll give him some time. I got some stuff I can talk about. How is everybody doing this evening? Uh, recovered from the... Uh, from the weekend's festivities, rolling right into the comic art, uh, uh, or no, the comic link in, uh, show, uh, blah, show. The auction is tonight, right? Right, right. Open mic night. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Red Jack. Yeah, I could invite people up here to, to uh, take over for me for a little while or to join me. But uh, yeah, maybe we should do like an impromptu comic link uh, watch party for a little bit. But, uh, you know, uh, we're going to give Bob some time here and see. So uh, if you, uh, we're an exhibitor at Comic Art Live. You've noticed I haven't sent any emails out uh, to you letting you know any anything, stats, that kind of stuff. Uh, I know some exhibitors are in the chat right now. There are a few things going on. Yeah, I could do shadow puppets, David. I, I wouldn't do a good job at it, let me tell you. But uh, let's see here. Sorry, I'm trying to, trying to pay attention to my emails just in case I get something from, from Bob here. No, nope, not yet. But uh, but yeah, let me. One thing that every exhibitor knows on the uh, from the uh, weekend shows that we do, I actually have uh, emailed stats out to everybody. We did talk about this after the show uh, on the recap, but let me go ahead and just share a screen here with you. I can I can show you where we're at with a few things. First up uh, here, see, I would have been talking about Bob's one of Bob's favorite, famous, most famous covers here, but we'll go ahead and take a look at. Uh, uh, over here. So I know Mikhail's in here. You had a booth this weekend. I put a stats link up in here now. So uh, rather than sending you an email every the end of every show, your stats link is going to be here. And the thing is, it'll actually be updated in real time for you. Uh, so every time you uh, come in here and refresh it during a show, you'll actually see your stats kind of change and everything. But so these this was my, you know, my poor booth that had no art for sale in it. Breaks down all the stuff, how much stuff you had. Uh, how much stuff you sold, uh, how many people saved your booth, how many people saved your artworks, all that kind of stuff. So if you're an exhibitor, that's where your stats are. Now, the feedback stuff is almost actually done, but I can't show you mine because I didn't. Well, I did sell stuff, didn't I? Uh, OK, let me see if it's uh, <laughs> let me see what we got here. Booth over here. Ba -da 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 -da. All right. So not yet formatted properly or anything like that, but you get the idea. There's a page that will be linked off of every exhibitor's booth where they will see only things that they sold. And the cool thing there is that, as you can see here, who, who wanted to buy some golf balls from me? Andy and Veronica Fish and Maureen Developer. So uh, so what happens is, is, you know, if a seller gets contacted by multiple buyers and ends up selling to the first one probably like they should they'll come over here they'll see that they actually had multiple contacts from it they'll be able to pick the one that they want to leave feedback for and they'll be able to leave feedback for them pretty good right and uh that's going to be integrated into their calf accounts and uh, shown throughout the whole place but uh you know i'm i'm doing my shadow puppet thing like david wetzel said uh and oh mr regek i'm sorry i think a lot of people are recovering from anthony's podcast sunday um yeah that was uh that was something to behold and i think well we're gonna see what he looks like tomorrow right i'm sure he's still got the kingpin look going um how many t-shirts did i sell asked marcus I, you can see i sold uh well how many did i sell look i tried buying one twice and t shen tried buying one and I think when T Shen tried to buy one, is when I've had to say it's a test item. I changed the title on it, so I, I didn't get any any trouble. But uh, but yeah, you can see this is the foundation for a feedback system that'll get integrated into Comic Art Live. And what'll happen is is that when the, the seller leaves feedback for the buyer, there will be a, a then a way for the buyer to leave feedback for the seller too, or you know a temporary system. Maybe the seller leaves feedback right after they ship the art. Buyer can wait till they get the art. Do the same thing for the seller. So, you know, 
trying to uh, get a few things in there. And you'll notice there is no negative. <laughs> now, why is there no negative? You know, I thought about leaving just a, you know, I recommend this person in the comments field. And then I decided, ah, we could do positive and neutral. But negative, my feeling is if, if you feel like you need to leave a negative for somebody, buyer or seller, contact me first. I bet you we could resolve those problems, right? I mean, we could probably figure something out and make you uh, move from that negative perspective to a neutral perspective. I think that would be better. So that's what I'm going to write into the, the instructions for leaving feedback. When it's that bad, I will get involved because I never want a bad transaction or a negative experience like that to happen on CAF. We will find a way to fix it. Ah, so yes, I'm still checking my mail. Still not seeing Bob in any of my communication lines, which is unfortunate we've never had i don't think i've ever been stood up have i i think i've always had and that's almost two and a half years not having something like this happen so what are you going to do everybody it's 907 mm -mm -mm. uh i don't know what what else would you like to talk about uh you know we could i could tell you dueling dealers tomorrow won't be won't be super uh won't have a lot of new stuff we haven't had any time to film any memes and um Actually, Maureen and Gwen are flying back to Ohio on Thursday because Gwen's got a job there beginning the middle of November through the first of the year. So Maureen's going up there with her to hang out. Uh, let's see. Yeah. But did you end up buying anything, Brian, after you got those emails? <laughs> to a Doctor Strange 2 watch along. Yeah. Favorite meal I've had since moving to Florida. Oh, boy. Uh I don't even think I've eaten out since I've been to Florida, really. So what if I had a meal here? What has Maureen made me that's uh, been unique? <laughs> She's probably watching right now. I don't know. But, you know, uh, Emma made donuts this weekend, and I haven't had one yet. And I bet I missed out on, on getting one. I was very interested to try one of them. Let Bill go have a drink. Well, I've got, I've got, I cracked open a Coke rather than a beer. I was all set for two hours here. Uh, oh, let's see. What do we got going on here? Oh. <laughs> ah, nice, Jeff. Jeff Wedding, are you actually with Kavi right now, or are you just sending me pictures from your your trip to uh, to uh, New York and New Jersey this weekend? I saw I got a picture from Nick Ferrucci the other day that had uh, uh, Jeff Wedding was hanging out at the Dynamite Studios with uh, with Nick. So yeah, that's uh, <laughs> I'm missing out. That was fun. I bet it looks like a good time. See so to talk about the oh the dentist. Okay. Uh, I can actually talk about that now. I've even gotten, I've got all the art and I have, I got the prices today. I haven't looked them over closely. There was a very, there's a very, very expensive piece in there and it's a, it's a more modern piece. I, you know, I'm not going to, I can't really tell you what it is because that would probably spoil it. I, you know, I'll end up, I would definitely will, will show it when we get to like the, the preview emails leading up to it. It is a, uh, uh, it's a Black uh, Panther piece related to the first movie, I can tell you. And it is very expensive. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't know what it was at first. And they didn't even define it. I had to go out and search for it. So I found it, know what it is, saw the price for it. But what other pieces? I, I can give you a few details on that because it was funny. The, the, when they sent me all their stuff, they literally, they there's nothing written on the artwork that tells me what it is. So I, I actually had to kind of dig around a little bit to figure out what artworks were... Uh, uh in here but i can i can tell you what nick verucci is going to be interested in, in a couple of these pieces because he actually owns a page or two from one of these which you know and, and i only found that out because i was digging around uh looking at different stuff here so let's see here what do we got i have uh there's some green arrow stuff there is there's actually a, a pair of black lightning pages from uh from some recent series there's some artwork from uh, deathstroke issue 11 from 2016 there is a what was it called convergence detective comics uh issue two there were about five or six pages from that uh what else so it was all things in the last 10 years for sure they didn't dig deep into the vaults, unfortunately. Uh, you know, hopefully, if this goes well, I'll, I'll be able to convince them to uh, to do that next time. But um, 
what was the other piece? And then there were three pieces. I couldn't couldn't figure out what the heck they were. So I ended up sending them back to Dennis and asking him what because one was one was labeled as a title G A S O. And I don't know if that's abbreviation for something uh, or uh, it, I mean, it must be right. Cowan pencils and Kevich inks. And then there was another one that looked like it said uh, no north or just north. I don't know. Uh, couldn't tell what that one was. And then there was this one page is really nice and literally has nothing written in the title. It just says it's, it comes with, from issue two. So I don't know at all what that was from. So, yeah. So there you go. Um, you mentioned you're going to have a comic art show. And uh, I, well, yeah, I mean, I can't tell you exactly where yet because I haven't done any searching. But um, we we're definitely going to do a show somewhere between Orlando and the Orlando to Tampa area. And the only reason I rather than sticking closer to Orlando, the only reason I kind of think about Tampa is because there are actually several artists that live in Tampa and I figure to make it easier to uh, to attract the the Tampa artists to the show, maybe being someplace between Tampa and Orlando wouldn't be bad. Uh, that, you know, that it's not a bad area, but you know, again, I have to look into the, you know, what the opportunities are, what kind of rental hall rentals, uh, convention center rentals, those sorts of thing. Uh, you know, so I've got a bit of, uh, got a bit of leg work to do on that, but that's why it's 2024. I knew I could not figure out what I wanted to do in 2023. So, you know, or where and how I would make it happen. Um, Still getting offers from Saved Artworks says Mr. Easy Go Lucky. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, I've actually been watching the sold count continue to go up. So, you know, as far as from all the uh, from the booths. So people are still marking art sold from uh, this weekend, which is pretty cool. They, uh, you know, things are still happening. So that's that's a good thing. You figured a lot of people probably sent uh, offers in and, uh, you know, what are you going to do? I think it's uh, sometimes it takes a few days to get things squared away. Um, yeah, I'm still, I'm looking at every email client I have open right now and Bob has not replied to any of them. Nope. Not even over there yet. So, uh, what are you going to do about that? So outside of that, you know, one of the things that kind of, we, we talked about after comic Art live, I, don't know, I talked, you know, I talked with Mark hey, about a few things, you know, I mean, he, he was kind of like, well, you know, maybe the sketch sale took away from commissions from artists during the show. And, uh, cause he felt like he didn't get as many commissions as he's gotten in the past. And, um, I, again, I, I thought, I know I mentioned talking to other, wanting to talk to other reps. I haven't yet, but, um, you know, one of the things I, that occurred to me that might be worth experimenting with because i also said we don't really get a lot of artists to participate in comic art live and um you know a comment i got from somebody who did exhibit this time around they had said that they didn't really think artists were welcome they figured it was a more of a collectors or dealers kind of show and you know of course i don't feel that way but it, it, it made me think you know that you know maybe we might want to experiment and try and do a uh, like an artist only show at some point you know maybe in between uh, comic art lives do a uh, straight, uh, you know, just artists or, or reps. Cause uh, you know, they can bring the artists in, but, uh, not do it. And, and then that kind of, kind of helped Mike keep, you know, keep the, uh, the main shows being collector dealer focus. Artists can still do it, do things there. But if we did a, even once a year, a, uh, just a strict artist show, I think that that might be interesting. And it also might, you know, turn on some collectors to calf who collect certain artists that, you know, They've, they've just never thought of using calf to kind of show off their stuff. So, you know, that uh, that was an idea that kind of fluttered about afterwards. Uh, Caesar just said he closed a deal on calf live today. Samuel Rojas says an artist and rep show would be cool. Yep, I think so. Um, Alberto wants to know, uh, you're out of town all weekend. You missed everything. What's the plan for the mystery sketches? When will they be shipped? Uh, the way it works is, you know, in most cases, you know, we work with reps in every every case, right? So they're, they're artists. Some of them are nearby. Some of them aren't. You know, a lot of Tatiana's artists are around the U.S. So in most cases, the you know, like I for for instance, I know with Ken, all four of his artists uh, all had five pieces. They're all done. They're all en route to Ken. Once Ken gets them, he ships them. So those are done. Uh, Tatiana has sent me. I think she only had like I forget how many pieces she had. Say, say like fifteen. I know that I've seen ten images from those <clears throat> and they are going to be sending again those will get sent to tatiana she'll send them out 
Uh, same thing with Marquet. Most of his artists were in South America. Uh, and fortunately, they're all kind of together. They're going to batch their artwork up, send it to Mark, and uh, then Marquet sends them out. And then with Jiggy, his guys will, um, uh, they get all their artwork to Jiggy. Jiggy sends his artwork to me, I Express, and then I pack it off and ship it. So, <clears throat> you know, by and large, I would say some people will start seeing their artwork shipped this uh, by the end of this week. And say 80% of the people will have their artworks starting the ship by the end of next week. And then certainly by middle of the following week after that, everybody should have their stuff in. For me, you know, when Jiggy, I'm kind of expecting to have Jiggy on it with an unboxing on the show next Thursday. He was really quick with getting and and they had like 35, 40 pieces last time. And they have a little bit more than that this time, but he, he had everything turned around pretty quickly. So so yeah, so expect that. And Alberto, you you know you did get uh, more than one, so you, you could have art with some with Jiggy, maybe one with Ken, one with Tatiana, and so you know they're going to come in separate more than likely. Um, how did the art reps do in Cal? Um, <clears throat> you know, I'd have to go back and look. I mean, I can look at. I've actually, I'm kind of using Tatiana's uh, account as a test account. Uh, I can't really tell. I guess I should go look at her stats. I'm not showing it to you, but you know, let's see here. Stats. Uh, uh, she only sold two repped pieces. I don't know how many c commissions she got. We don't track commissions. Um, she sold, uh, uh, you know, decent. She sold more in her uh, regular booth, eight pieces over there. Uh, I can't remember what Mark. Mark Hay sold. He had, uh, I think he sold like three or four Jock Batman covers. So for high dollar, I mean, I think they totaled over 40 grand. But of course, you know, Mark said, I could have sold those on my site anyway. But, you know, and, and that, yeah, that's true. But, uh, you know, those are things that help bring people into your booth. You know, I didn't really look at, I'm not looking at the stats right now, but Kiroskiro was set up. Um, they always tend to do well because they pick pieces specific, uh, you know, that they specifically want to drop during the show. And that's their way of getting people into their booth. They've all, always done a very good job of that. Um, but that's kind of why, you know, that with that thought about reps and artists, that's why I felt like having a show that is exclusive to reps and artists, uh, you know, I just should say artists and then reps would be, uh, I think, an interesting thing to try because certainly there's less pressure on, on the uh, on CAF members to get their stuff set up. You're just really, uh, you know, waiting to see what the artists are going to bring, who's going to have commission opportunities. Uh, it would probably make for an interesting weekend of panels. And um, uh, so, yeah, we'll see. Will there be a CAF update on Thanksgiving? Uh, you know, I, I don't know, Thomas. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think, I can't really say. Probably not. I should probably take that day off. Maybe do it on Friday. Yeah, that's probably what I would do. Uh, at, I think during Thanksgiving... I mean, Maureen and Gwen, I don't even think are going to be here. So Emma and I are probably going to go over to Maureen's parents. So, so yeah, it'll probably be an off day for us. Uh, all the YouTube links in your emails have been off. On what On what emails? I guess you'd have to let me know, West. You mean like the daily emails? I, I mean, I'd have to ask Colin about that. Check them. Check them out. Uh, I don't. I'd have to see. I don't get since I don't put the daily emails together. I don't really click the links on the emails or you know on any of those links in there too often. I just scan them, make sure everything. There's no typos or anything like that. Uh, maybe send an email some of the older. Right. Well, Mr. Red Jack. Yeah, exactly. That. Uh, that's my thought. You know, if you make a show exclusive for artists and you let them know that it's going to be uh, in front of the largest art collecting community online, I think we should be able to attract quite a few artists. And if we could put the word out three, six months out that we're doing that. I'd like to think that we can attract, you know, an interesting group of artists. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of the reps that we already have, but we should probably be able to, you know, interest a lot more, uh, you know, others as well. So, so yeah, but West, uh, you're saying on the daily email. Yeah, I'll look into it. I'll, I'll take a look at it, but at the end of the day, uh, yeah, that's, that would be Colin. I mean, who knows? We, if they're going to the wrong ones, maybe he's not updating a, a link here or there. I mean, anything is possible. That's for sure. So okay, I'm still going to keep checking my email here, everybody, just in case I'm getting something from Bob. Because at this point, I'm def I, you know, I would want to do something, you know, where I can get closer to two hours out of him, even if he were to come in here. I'd tell him we're going to have to do it, do it another day. 
but I've got nothing. I've got nothing from him. I hope he's okay because we we literally emailed on Saturday because that was when I put the thumbnail together for his show. So uh, and so he knew we were all on for tonight. Uh, Samuel saying cadence essential. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, all, all of them, I, I would think, and more. So I, th I think we can definitely do something uh, in that vein. Just a question of picking times. When Maureen and I were talking, I was saying it should probably be, I don't want it to be near what we're going to be doing in February, beginning in 2024. So if I were to try something, it would probably be sometime around the August time frame with artists. But that'll give us a lot of time to prep people for it. And, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see. I think it's a good idea. I really think we would uh, we would do well for uh, for artists that were willing to participate, take commissions, that sort of thing. I, I definitely wouldn't do a sketch op leading into that. I would let let the artists really focus on getting their own commissions and setting their own price levels and those sorts of things. And um, I think that that would be a be of interest to uh, to many of us and a good opportunity to discover new artists too, right? Uh, would definitely be interested in that. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to scroll through here. Hey, Ian, nice to see you. Um, yeah, I do hope he's okay, too. It is odd. But um, but I will definitely follow up with him and see uh, see what happened. And I'll reschedule him because right now I, I don't have anybody scheduled after tonight for Tuesday interviews. I've got a dozen people I could ask, but um, I'll just shoot. What I'll try to do is shoot him an email and uh, maybe I do have his number, too. Um, but I'll reach out to him and see if we can't reschedule him for next Tuesday. And I don't know why I have a scratchy throat now. It's probably this coat. Mm. See, and I even got my superhero ABC book ready that I picked up from Bob when he published it. When was that? I think that was 2006, maybe. Let's see. 2006, yeah. Superhero ABC. Look, it's To the Amazing Ashton. It's Ashton's book. I took it. He doesn't have it now. But uh, I, was, I always like that. And so did Ashton. So did my daughters, too. They love that book, too. Exposure, exposing children to uh, the, the uh, comics and their ABCs at an early age. Uh, man, what else? Did I, uh, there were other things I was thinking about talking to everybody about, but I, I wasn't ready to do it today. Hmm. No, no. I guess I'll pass on all that. Well, I guess I'm just going to call it, I don't, I don't know, I should call it a night, right? I mean, what else would you like? I mean, anybody likes to talk, like to talk about anything that uh, went on this weekend? I mean, I'm going to send out the surveys probably tomorrow and the follow-up emails with all the exhibitors. But, um, I, I, you know, by and large, I, I, you know, I'm still happy with the way the weekend turned out. I mean, maybe we're starting to see a little bit of a slight downturn in things. I mean, you know, maybe the reason we didn't have those couple big home run pieces was because uh, sellers are holding back their, well, not all sellers are holding back their six or seven figure <laughs> pieces, but uh, maybe some people are, right? It's hard to say, but uh, I think we're sitting right around like 960,000 in sales. So, you know, that's at this point, that's probably about 200, 250 down from where we were at in, uh, uh, you know, in the May show at, at about this time. So, yeah, you just never know. So I can confirm I have no cell service at Anthony's warehouse. <laughs> Jeff, thank you for that. Oh, now we know. Now we know. Um, there were no cap covers. The world is ending. <laughs> really? Uh, you know, well, Ron, that's what I was all set to do, honestly. That's why I had that page open up to my uh, to my calf gallery. But um I had, I had things set up just to start looking at some of his most popular art on calf, right? And the thing is, is it was funny. You know, it's hard for me to find pieces that, um, you know, that were his pencils where it was high up in the comments or view side of things because, you know, he he's such a prolific inker. Those are the things that I really wanted to talk about. Well, I wanted to talk a lot with to him about you know whom he's inked, his experiences with so many different people from, you know, Zach to John and Sal. Um, I mean, you name it, he's inked practically everybody. And, uh, look at Marcus posted that great, uh, saga, the Submariner, uh, with Rick, with Rich Buckler pencils and Bob McLeod inks this week. It, look at that. It's, it's already the fifth highest commented piece of artwork from, uh, that has Bob McLeod tagged as a pencil or inker or anything on it. So 
you know, I don't think Sue's really upset about what's going on here, of course. But uh, but again, I think that, you know, that's pretty cool in and of itself. I mean, to have to have a piece that was just added to calf be ranked because this is this uh, list here is actually ordering by most commented artwork by Bob that was flagged as published. So right there, you, you never see a new piece of art fall that high. But uh, and I didn't read the comments. I'm sure they're all very entertaining. But uh, <laughs> yeah, every interview, you want me to ask everybody what their favorite sandwich is? OK, I can do that. I know he was, he was an inker mostly, Marcus. And, and I, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, so is Senate, right? I mean, so were uh, a lot of our, uh, uh, you know, some of the most prolific artists that we have out there are were inkers, right? So nothing wrong with that. Bob did a great job. I was kind of looking through his stuff, you know, because he inked Frank Miller, Bill Sienkiewicz. I mean, he he's inked a, uh, a who's who in Marvel and DC. So, uh, you know, he he kind of crossed over, you know, a, a lot. And again, had a super interesting career. So, you know, he did more DC pencils. Yeah, I, would, I was, I did pick out, but you know what? There's not a lot of comments on DC art on, on the site, Marcus. So they weren't at the top of my list. Uh Oh, really? A colon Dracula page with uh, his inks. Actually, you know, the thing that I did notice when I was going through his index over at uh, comics.org, and I, I guess I kind of knew this, but I, is his first like four years in uh, in comics, he was doing a lot of uh, work for horror stories. So that was kind of, you know, where he kind of, I, I assume after Neil got him a few gigs, that was kind of what they set him to. So he was doing too much Dracula. Uh, he was doing he was doing stuff in crazy some what if stuff um what other i mean I, there was a whole bunch of other titles in that in those late 70s because i think he started what in like 74 75 so yep he had a very interesting career that submariner cover was a heritage pickup a while back it did look sort of familiar conan looks like he hit up the love chance uh yeah he did conan uh he hit a home run he hit a grand slam right there but uh, yeah, I mean, that's John Buscema's uh, pencils. Uh, let's see. This piece had, uh, it was a Star Wars piece with Palmer inks on him. That's kind of interesting. Um, a Thundercats cover in Khalil's gallery. Ron Friends pencils, Bob McLeod inks. And Todd McFarlane. Bob, uh, Bob inked Todd a few times too. John Byrne. This is in Dino's calf gallery, a New Mutants page. So so yeah, I mean, he's got, I mean, he, uh, Keown. There's a bunch of Keown art in the uh, top like five pages of most commented stuff that uh, Bob inks. So it's like, he, you know, he inks everybody. So <clears throat> yeah. See, as, as Henry says, you name it, he's inked him. But uh, yeah, I wanted him to be telling us all about this. Yeah. It's still no emails from him, but I, I do hope everything's cool. Uh, I will, you know, yeah. Cause uh, <laughs> that would, that would kind of suck. But uh, did, did characters forget how to think? I don't know what that means, Brody. Uh, but uh, oh, you mean with the thought bubbles? I get you. I get you. No, they never. They didn't forget to think. But um, yeah, what other things? I had, I had a whole list of stuff I wanted to talk to him about too, especially after the Jim Shooter in interview, because he were you know, a lot of the books that uh, that McLeod worked on. Um, Louis Simonson was his editor around him too. So I was kind of curious about those sorts of things. I wanted to ask him if Chris Claremont handpicked him to, uh, to do some of those pencil fill in issues on, on X-Men, you know, when, when uh, he stepped in what around 152, uh, you know, just out of curiosity because of the way Jim Shooter said how, how much Claremont picked his teams. So yeah, I had a whole set of questions. You know, he, 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 he was the anchor on uh, X-Men 94, right? I mean, holy mackerel, this guy's touched everything uh bob sold his his own art for a long time on his site that is true he's kind of repped by i don't know you know i don't know anything about these people i saw that they had a booth at um megacon when i went there but i don't know who these people are they don't seem to have their i mean maybe some people know i'll actually pull this tab over there because they're called like mb artist i have no idea what mb artist stands for um, they rep a few different people, but if I go over to their homepage, so they, there's a lot of Bob's art on there. Um, Bob, Chad Harden, I mean, uh, Rubenstein. Uh, so yeah, I don't, and it was weird They they had a booth at Megacon and it was right at the front and there was nobody in it. There was like, there was no staff. It was just like 
it was almost like a big billboard and it was uh it was kind of like an end cap so it went all around and it had like these like images of everybody uh that they rep but there was not a single person working there so it's uh weird you know i don't really uh, get uh, what they how they how they uh, do their thing but i've never had any contact with them but they've clearly been around for a little bit to uh to have uh bob in there but but yeah bob's um he, I agree. He did sell his own stuff for a while, but it seems like he's being managed by whomever this outfit is. Never been to Matt MagaCon. <laughs> Neither have I, Marcus. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, Knights of Old. But my, Knights of Old, why didn't you participate in the in uh, the weekend show? Was it uh, you're just busy? Bad, bad weekend for you? It just didn't fit into the schedule um because you know but it was uh no i mean i could we could do some kind of recap i guess but that's that's kind of what we did at the end of the show just to kind of give people a flavor for things but you know the panels were fun I, I, the saturday panels are always good the sunday ones are, are sometimes tough to get through uh, though uh uh I, I really enjoyed getting to hang out with paulo i haven't done a, a panel with him from beginning to end in a long time uh <laughs> you guys can answer for Bob. Yeah, that's true. We could try that. Um, <clears throat> uh, I like Bob Sinks on uh, Bill's Moon Knight as well. When it, yeah, when it was in Rampaging Hall. And Bob, you know, he when he did some work with Colin, he did, uh, you know, he liked did these ink wash things as well. So it's it's interesting, you know, how he really did adapt some of his styles. Uh, you don't understand the buying selling part. Really, of the con? So you've probably never been to any of the any of our shows then nights of old as far as uh you know go, sitting in and checking out how the con looked uh bob zinks on craven's last hunt uh was awesome as well super yeah all right well you know what nights of old i mean I, I can do a real quick just overview since you're here and you didn't didn't see it but uh the easiest way you know it essentially the whole show is all about it's it's a con man everybody you know there were 303 exhibitors they brought six thousand artworks to the show and uh you know including the um reps who brought some of their own stuff so of course nobody else can get the, to this any longer only i can because i am an admin but uh you know this essentially you'd go to slash comic art live on the uh, domain there comicartfans.com comic art live and this is like the entryway into the show it's like you could um very easily just kind of come in and we feature a couple pieces at the start show you know show all the panels that you got to see but um the uh you know i could show you just the sunday art drop i guess kind of pop over for that but but essentially it's just like a you know you're, you're there are exhibitor booths but the key was is really the site search for it that was built for it hey you're not gonna leave this bob mcleod as uh, at least his his uh, webcam has popped in here i might not have to do my song and dance anymore but and we could talk more about Comic Art Live as a show uh, this weekend. I'm not gonna I'm not getting an image on Bob's camera yet, though. So um, so at any rate, ah, there is Bob. So hey, I am gonna I'm gonna close my my share window here. I don't have to do that anymore. Actually, I'll go back to where I was, which was um, that search for for Bob's artwork. So Bob, how are you? Hey. I'm good. I'm very sorry I'm late, Bill. Uh, things going on here and just ran way behind. That's not a problem. I was get, I was getting worried. I was telling everybody that you know maybe we should schedule for next Tuesday or something. I did, I I was worried that uh, we weren't going to be able to get this in. I'm I'm very sorry. Um, family stuff going on. Uh, we were on vacation for like six weeks and just got back last week and then immediately I got. Uh, you know what positional vertigo is? I've heard of it. Yeah. Kind of dizziness um, where anytime I wasn't vertical, I was just, the, everything was spinning around. Um, so I just got over that uh, kind of this morning. <laughs> well, so just been dealing with a lot of stuff. Well, do you want to, I, I would, I'm fine. If you're, if you're available next Tuesday, I'd rather, you know, take it easy for the rest of the week. I, I'm okay with waiting till I don't have anybody on my schedule. You were the last person I had actually booked. I don't, my Tuesdays are open through the end of the year. <laughs> so if, you, if you're free next Tuesday, I'd be more than happy, you know, give you a week to, to recoup and, uh, and, and then let's, we can just do it next, next week. I would, I'm, I would I almost feel better. I, I hate the, the thought of putting you through a, an interview and having you feel a little down. 
No, that's okay. I'm I'm here now and I'm feeling good right now. Unless you want to put it off till next week, I'm I'm ready to go. Okay. Okay. Well, and every most of the people are still here. They they were they were just listening to me talk about other things that I had going on. So um so sure. Well, they, see now that I I prepped everybody. I I was like, well, I was going to ask Bob this and show him that, and and so now they get half of the interview. But um but so Bob, obviously, you know, you I've you're one of the guys I talk about a lot when I talk about con sketches and everything, because, you know, I've probably gotten five or six from you over the years and they're always perfect. It's like you, you do not, you know, you're, you, you draw so consistently that, you know, I haven't seen a bad commission come out of you ever. And I can't think that anybody would, could ever could argue that point with me. Oh, I could argue that. Point <laughs> with I wish I felt the same way about him. I try very hard every time I do a sketch for somebody. You know, I think it's important to try to give uh, the fans their money worth. And, um, you know, I take pride in my own work. And um, I hope that I've never um, uh, not put my, you know, my best efforts in. I, I always try to do my best. Well, well uh, for me, you have. So, uh, and, you know, and, and that was interesting get, uh, when we ran into each other at Megacon. So was that one of your first cons kind of back uh, after the pa pandemic or? Um, no, I've been back uh, quite a while. I got in uh, kind of in the middle of the pandemic. There were some cons starting up. Uh, was it for, I don't remember the first one I went to. It was kind of the, oh, yeah, I do. It was Florida. Um, is that the one you're talking about, Megacon? From Megacon one when it was in. Was 2021? it like May? No, this no, was I didn't in, do the 2021 one. Yeah, you're right. They in, did postpone uh, it and did it later. You're right. This was in August. Uh, yeah. I was down in Florida um, when the virus was raging down there. Um, but we were vaccinated and boosted, and um, I was wearing a mask. Um, and I think at that when everybody was supposed to be vaccinated, I don't remember. Um, uh, but you know, knock on wood, I, I was lucky and um, have not uh, gotten COVID from any convention I've been to. And I've been to several. Um, I did end up getting it from my wife. <laughs> at uh, she, I think she picked it up at, a, at the local bookstore last May. Uh, so we both had it last May. Well, it wasn't. I, I had it at the beginning of the year. I got it whenever the variant was out. And uh, it wasn't fun. But uh, but yeah, I'm glad it's over with. <laughs> I'm one of those people that had almost no symptoms. Um, whenever I got the vaccinations, my arm wasn't even sore. Uh, I, I've been very lucky. It's, it's been, uh, you know, not a problem with me. Well, that's, that's great. I mean, some people got it, uh, you know, pretty bad. I, I had I a few know. friends who uh, were, were laid up for a few weeks. Sure. So. Yeah, I, know. I know people that were uh, sick longer than that. <laughs> Yikes. So, uh, so sorry, I'm getting these uh, things are popping up here on my screen without me wanting to do it. Uh, well, you know, Henry's asking a question that we'll definitely get to about, you know, artists that you were uh, you enjoyed inking over the years, because, of course, you've had a long, long uh, story career. But, you know, I want to kind of go back to, you know, maybe, you know, when you first started working uh, in comics and, and really kind of the experience with, uh, you know, with some of the opportunities, maybe, you know, the Neil Adams might have had uh, in your career working at continuity or doing the crusty bunkers thing. I was kind of that early part of your career. I thought we could kind of start there a little bit and tell us how, uh, how you got started with that. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, my, I pretty much owe my career to Neil. I went up to his uh, studio when I was trying to get into the business. Uh, Pat Broderick and I were roommates at the time and Pat kept, Pat kept telling me I needed to go up and meet Neil Adams. And so, you know, I was so, ignorant going into this business. Um, I didn't know anything. I was from Florida and was not a huge comic fan at the time. I was more into Mad Magazine, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I went up and met Neil and showed him my samples and they were, uh, you know, not superheroes. I, I had a, like a Mad Magazine type sample and something else. And um, he said, well, what do you want to, what do you want? And I said, anything that pays because <laughs> I had sold my car to finance a trip up to New York to try to start my career. And I was down to like $10, um, was going to call my parents for bus money back home. 
Um, so he picked up the phone and, and got me a job in the production department at Marvel doing lettering corrections. Um, and that was a wonderful way to break in the business um, because I could show my samples to all of the editors, everybody right there. I met, you know, Roy Thomas and Marv Wolfman and all the other guys. And um, right. Stan was, his office was right down the hall a little ways. John Romita was like 10 feet away from me uh, where his office was. Um, you know, it was, it was great. It was like a small family at that time, you know, Cadence publications owned on Marvel at the time. And um, uh, it was just a, a nice kind of a friendly atmosphere uh, to work in. And um, Eventually, I started getting some freelance work and, and left the production department and uh, went over to Neil's studio. And, you know, at the time, pretty much anybody that walked in the door of Neil's studio could be a crusty bunker. It's just <laughs> the artist that wanted to could chip in on the inking of, of these jobs. And uh, Neil would get the the jobs from Marvel. And, of course, he would make probably three times the money in advertising that he was making in comics. So he was working on the better paying stuff and uh, would ink the principal figures in these jobs. Uh, and then we were, you know, he would tell us to ink backgrounds and minor little figures in the background and that kind of stuff. Um, and we would get paid at his page, page rate, which was the best rate in the business. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, you know, nobody just starting out and I was getting the top rate in the business inking on these crusty bunker, bun bunker jobs. And, you know, I could watch Neil Inc. I could watch Russ Heath Inc. And um, Ralph Reese and Dick Giordano. And, um, you know, it was just an incredible learning experience. Uh, it taught me a lot. I can't imagine what that would have been like. I mean, like you said, you're down to your last dollars, and the next thing you know, you're 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 sitting there next to uh, people who've had great experience, you know, years of experience in the in the hobby. We're already you know doing really well. I mean, Ralph Reese was a fantastic, uh, yeah, uh, illustrator in, in his own right, and so yeah, you were surrounded. And Russ Heath, let alone, I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, you could watch Russ Heath working on those haunted tanks with his number four brush, just doing that line down the barrel of the tank freehand. He was amazing. I can't eat, you know, to be a fly <laughs> in the wall watching that happen that would, be, yeah. it would be crazy. So, uh, so, so you did a lot of work at Continuity, Continuity Studios, or was, uh, were you kind of back and forth between the Marvel offices, or was it mostly working at Continuity? No, what would what we would do is uh, we would each rent uh, office space up at Continuity. So mm -hmm. I had my own little desk up there. And I would work on my freelance jobs in in Neil's studio. Um, and then when a crusty bunker job came in, you know, I would do a little bit here and a little bit there. You know, the way we did it was just pieces of figures, little parts of backgrounds. Nobody ever inked like an entire page. It was just everybody was a little piecemeal. Um, How did you know which pieces were yours? Go <laughs> whatever you wanted. You could just take oh, a page and just ink whatever you felt like. You know, Neil, like I said, would Ted, you know, leave the big figures for me. I want to ink Conan, but if you want to ink the guy in the background, go ahead. Um, you know, so and he never really, uh, at least with me, never really. Uh, tried to teach me, tried to guide me or anything. One time I was doing some uh, special effect on a on a Conan page where Conan was drunk or I forget in a, a drug state or whatever. And he was having all this illusion stuff in the background. And I was doing these little whatevers. And Neil just looked over my shoulder and said, slow down. You know, take a little more care with each line, I think, is is what he was trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. I mean, was he ever dissatisfied with the work that uh, the Krusty Bunkers did? I mean, would he ever look at a, uh, at a panel and just say, it's not right, we got to do it over, cut that panel out and put a new new one in there where I'm going to redraw it? And I'm sure he was, I'm sure he was dissatisfied with a lot of it, but he would make sure that it was um, up to a certain standard. Um I, I never saw him ink over something, but he probably 
would have. I, I know he inked over a lot of things um, on some other jobs um, if he wasn't happy with them. So probably. Um, but I, again, he was busy. Right. You know, he was busy on his ad work. Um, and uh, none of it was downright awful. <laughs> you know, we were we were not doing anything that we were going to do a really bad job on. Um, I might have been the least experienced of the people around. I mean, Bob Wyacek was just starting out. He did a little bit. Terry Austin um, was probably a little more advanced at the time. Um, I'm trying to think who might have done something bad, and I can't really think of anybody. Well, I mean, you know, Bob uh, Wyacek and Terry Austin and yourself, I mean, you're all so accomplished you know, at what you were doing. I can't, you know, you, I, I find it hard to believe that it could have happened, but still, I mean, and you look at your careers, the, the, you know, you, this is three of you alone, uh, you know, had amazing careers, uh, you know, in comics and all started, you know, and did a lot of work early on in continuity. That's just uh, that's a and testament, I, would, I guess. Is that Neil's eye? I mean, is it was, was I would it, give a lot of credit to Neil inspiring yeah. us. And um, again, just the atmosphere being in his continuity studios with all those great artists around soaking up all of their uh, knowledge and, and experience. Um, it was a it was a wonderful break into the business, a wonderful way to start a career um, with those people around and and um being able to go and talk to people while they're working and look at what they're doing um, and just, um, you know, being in that group uh, was, was a great experience. I didn't appreciate it as much at the time as I should have. Uh, retrospect, you know, looking back, it was amazing. At the time, I was just um, soaking it all in and trying to learn how to, to do everything. Right. So you, you, I was you kind of lucky enough to learn on the job. You know, I got paid while I was learning um, because I, you know, I didn't know how to ink before I started inking. I just kind of picked up the pen and the brush and, and started, jumped in with both feet, <laughs> you know, and you, and you just learn by doing. So when you first got there, you had done a lot, a lot of pencil examples. So, those, you know, that side, you hadn't done a lot of inking when you were trying to see what I mean, work you might be able to get initially? I had done some inking on my samples and I knew professional artists, or at least I had heard professional artists ink with a brush. So I was inking with probably a bad brush, um, you know, just trying to figure out how to do this stuff. Um, and then in, you know, working in the production department, I would see all of the best artwork come through that I was doing lettering corrections on. Mm -hmm. So I could study it and um, actually started out <clears throat> doing some backgrounds for Mike Esposito. You know, so Mike would show me a couple things and I did some backgrounds for Al Milgram and Klaus Janssen. Um, and then I started, uh, you know, getting my early freelance jobs on the old Kung Fu magazines, um, the black and white uh, magazines at the time um that i don't know how well they were selling and they didn't care as much about them as the color comics mm. um, this is why they would start new guys like me <laughs> uh, but i did okay i mean i i feel like i had somewhat of an aptitude for inking so it, it came fairly easily to me and i feel like i progressed pretty quickly yeah i mean i know earlier in your uh career a lot of the titles were kind of horror based or uh Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, those those sorts of things. I you know I saw a lot of credits for that, so that was kind of where they started you out. You know to give you a place to kind of at least see what you were capable of doing, whether you could meet deadlines, those sorts of things. I guess. Yeah, yeah, probably. So when the uh, at continuity, did they work like around the clock? I was kind of going to ask the same question, and then uh, Knightsfold had a similar one where you know they asked, uh, "Did you guys listen to music? How off? You know, did people work all night? I mean, was it a regular schedule? Did Neil expect everybody to be in at nine at the very very?" Oh gosh, least? no. I mean, there was no schedule. Uh, 
people were working all hours over, overnight, you know, some people working all, all night and sleeping during the day, some people working during the day and sleeping at night, coming and going all the time. Um, there was a front office with Neil and Russ Heath, and I think, um, uh seems like somebody else was up there i don't remember um various times you know someone might be in that office with the two of them mm -hmm. doing stuff and then there were there was a hallway jack abel's office was right there um and then i i was next to jack in the next one and then terry and bob wyacek were in the next one so, you know, a hallway with, with each of us at our own little desks and we could go in and talk to each other and go see what the other guy was doing and, and whatever. And of course, I was always interested in what Neil and Russ were doing. So I'd go peek over their shoulders. Um, but there there was no schedule at all. It was just um, all of us working, you know, 16 hours a day, every every waking hour. Wow. But and, uh... Uh, was playing. Yeah, people would have music on. Um, Terry Austin liked to listen to Bob and Ray, the old radio show. So he mm -hmm. would have that going on. Jack would have, um, Jack Abel would have some kind of, uh, like Tony Bennett playing or something. I don't know, you know, the old, uh, standards, um, it'd be something a little more current up in Neil's area. Well, so, I mean, that sounds like a fun environment. And and I guess Neil was, as long as the work was getting done, he didn't mind if you came in at 1 p.m. or 7 a.m. Just just stick to the schedule, right? Yeah, well, you know, we weren't working so much for Neil. Usually we had our own projects. Oh, got it. Time. Yep. Um, he had his ad work, which uh, he and Dick were doing at the time. I mean, this was the early 70s. Later on, it changed um, and more people... Uh, started doing continuity work. Um, uh, those uh, comics that um, what was it? There was a the uh, emergency was one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. I forget what all they were they were working on because I had left by then. I I was only there from seventy six to seventy nine. Okay. And a lot of the continuity stuff that uh, a lot of people are familiar with was more in the 80s. Right. Um, and then people actually were working under Neil and he was supervising and um, other people would uh, pencil and he would ink and he would do little layouts and people would uh, pencil from him, all, all kinds of stuff where he was much more involved. Um, but when I was there... Um, most of the time, Neil was doing his own projects. We were all doing our own projects, and then occasionally a crusty bunker job would come in. Usually a Conan job. <laughs> so, how would you guys track something like that in terms of uh, compensation? I mean, did, was there a you know a clipboard around where you would say you know Bob worked on uh, you know pages five, seven, and nine, and you know how how did you manage to work that out? That's the most incredible thing about it. Um, we would just take a page and um, ink a foot here and a hand there and a bush there. And after it was all finished, Neil would go over every page and he would recognize each artist's style. And he, oh, well, Bob McLeod inked this bush right here and he would circle it. And I inked a hand here. He would circle that and put, you know, my initials in each one of those circles. And then he would look at the page overall after he was finished figuring out what everybody did. And I did 10% of that page. So I would get 10% of the page rate. Uh, so that was, you know, very time intensive for him, I would think. Um, and I'm amazed to this day that he was willing to take his time uh, to do that. Um, again, you know, it, it was an, an incredible thing. Yeah, Rich Cirillo just mentioned that uh, you guys were doing emergency six million dollar man in space 1999 for Charlton during the mid 70s. Yeah, but that was that was after that. That was after I left. Um, maybe in 79 they had started on emergency and six million dollar man because I remember seeing those. Um, but I never worked on those. Um, that was that was the uh, new crew of guys that he got in. I was working on, there was a Bob Brown job uh, with uh, Satana in it, was one of the first ones we did. And we did a 
couple Savage Sword jobs, um, uh, Savage Tales with Kazar, um, not a lot of other stuff that I remember. Okay. So uh, Peter Rowe wanted to know what Jack Abel was like. <laughs> Jack was a great guy. Um, he would kind of uh, sing while he was working. He had a nice voice. Mm -hmm. um, he always had a lot of stories uh, that we would hang around and listen to him, uh, go out to lunch with him and um, hang around his studio, uh, listening to him tell stories and joke, joke around. He had a good sense of humor. Um, everybody liked Jack. He, he was a great guy. I mean, that's what I've heard. I mean, I, I think uh, most people that I've spoken to had a, have very fond memories of Jack Abel. So. We actually did a tribute book uh, to Jack Abel um, where all of us did a page or two. And it's a, it's a book that we put out. Um, people can find it probably on eBay. Huh. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I'll, I'll look it up. Jack I'll, Abel try to, I'll try to um, send you a... Uh, image of it or uh, a link to it. Okay. Yeah, I've not, I, I've not heard of that one. Uh, let's see. Rich Cirillo wanted to know was uh, when, when Mortimer up at continuity when you were there or was that later? I never met when Mortimer there. Um, Wally Wood came up one time. I met Wally Wood. Um, who else? Um, of the early guys, I don't remember eating, meeting any of the other old timers there um mike uh what was his name mike uh did uh package design mike god what was his name can't remember his name now but he he, he specialized in in just doing the art for uh like toy packages or whatever mm -hmm. you know someone has to design all that stuff um that was what he was doing um I don't remember a lot of other people coming up there, though. You know, oh, they weren't they weren't more closer to my age. The older guys, um, Wallywood was the only one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Well, it still was a it, I don't know a very interesting time. The, the late seventies seemed to be. Uh, I mean, the, the things that uh, Neil was doing. I mean, not just in comics, but in advertising was it was yeah. just incredible i don't know how he had the energy to, to get all that work done he was a workhorse he i never saw neil when it wasn't just working really hard yeah let's see uh, a couple of comments here from uh henry he said that uh, bob i always loved your use of zipatone you had a great sense of how to use it uh when and where a cool effect that sadly is not uh, used that often anymore wasn't zipatone great um i kind of uh, was really admiring what uh, Tom Palmer was doing. So I was trying mm -hmm. to emulate uh, Tom's inking. And um, as far as where to put zip, where not to, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, I guess it's one of those things uh, you just have an eye for or you don't maybe. I mean, I would say I would just do what I saw, what I saw Tom Palmer doing, uh, but I don't know that I always put it where he would have put it or, or he might not have put it where I put it. I, I, I don't know. It's hard to, hard to explain. So, you know, Tom's, uh, you know, was a, has an incredible career as well. I mean, we, you know, we just lost him, but you know, he, he was, he, he was so versatile. I mean, he, he made some, some artists work look so much better, like a Gene Colon. I just thought like Tom's inks on, on Colin were mind blowing. I mean, I, I own a couple pages because, and cause I, I had a hard time like liking Gene's, work but when tom inked him i mean i know you you inked colon as well i mean it, it's it's funny how um certain inkers can kind of bring out the best in pencilers and i mean when you're doing the work are you thinking a lot about that or are you really trying to think about trying to stay true to the pencil line when you're when you're depending on the, the style of the artist that you're working with I mean, I would obviously be influenced by the style of the penciler, but I was not the kind of inker that was worried about staying true to the pencils so much. What I was trying to do is just make the job look as good as I thought I could make it look. Mm -hmm. um, so if that meant keeping what the penciler had, I would go with that. If it meant maybe making some alterations, I would go with that. I'd I wasn't against, you know, changing, trying to improve the perspective or the anatomy 
or the lighting or rendering, whatever. Um, I was never, I, I didn't feel that I had to be restrained by what the penciler had done. I thought the whole point of it was to do good art. So um, I just tried to always uh, make the art look good. Um, it's interesting with Gene Colan, his own ink, he was, a, when he did his own ink, he was a brush inker. Um, very different from what Tom Palmer would do, who was mainly a pen inker and um, a very slick inker, whereas, you know, Gene Colden's own inking was uh, much more um, of the earlier styles, you know, from the 50s and 60s. Um, so it's such a contrast in the way he would approach his own work and then the way Palmer would or I would. Um, and yet it looked so good when Palmer would. I mean, it, it was like I felt like uh, Tom Palmer was born to ink Gene Colan. It, it, it's such a perfect meld. True, wasn't it? It was. It was so surprising. I mean, Tom, because Tom, you know, he he was great on a lot of people, but his work with Gene was just incredible. I mean, I, I don't know. Every page I look at that he worked on Gene with, it, it just is fantastic, and I stuff, can't believe. Yeah. I don't know how he did it. I've got a page of uh, Tomb of Dracula. That was my favorite ser series. I like the art of Gene and Tom, and I like Marv's writing on that. Mm -hmm. uh, of all the comics uh, that I read, that was my favorite um, because of the three of them work so well together, I thought. I liked uh, them both on Doctor Strange, too. That was pencil and ink. Doctor Strange, Daredevil. Yeah. Um, I yeah. liked um, Tom Sinking over Ross Andrew on... Um, uh, what was it, Doc, uh, Doc Savage? You know, I don't know if I've seen. I'd have to go look that up. I'm not I, some I'm nice not, looking stuff. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I take lots of notes while I do these interviews because there's. I, I love going back and checking these things out. All right. So Doc Savage with them. All right. Cool. I, um, uh, Peter's asking a question back about Jack Abel. He wanted to know if that there was. Uh, let's see. What was it? Any particular story that Jack Abel told about his career that was particularly memorable or funny? What did you think of Abel's techniques? Uh, P.S. Thank you for your cap and JSA sketches. I guess he's Peter's picked <laughs> up a few things from you in the past. Yes. Um, you know, it's too long ago for me to remember any particular stories Jack told, except he said he went to high school with Tony Bennett. And he said, Tony Bennett was no great shakes back then. <laughs> <laughs> he, he thought uh, he could uh, hang with Tony Bennett uh, vocally and, um, you know, sang a little uh, Left My Heart in San Francisco for us. Um, like I said, he had a nice voice. Um, he was, we, we would watch Jack Inc. Um, he had a little... Uh, bottle of ink on his uh, drawing table with um, a piece of paper next to it. And he would stick his uh, brush in the ink and then, you know, brush the paper below it to get the excess ink off. And then he would start inking. Um, and I would watch him if he did, if he was doing a, I watched him do a circle one time freehand with a pen and he would just kind of find his way around that circle, you know, perfect circle, um, but he didn't use a compass or anything. He, he did it freehand. He had a lot of control. He was a very clean inker, uh, you know, um, very precise. Again, you, you know, an older technique, older style, um, but he was very careful with his inking. Interesting. Let's see. Uh... Sorry, I'm looking through here. So when you were and just, uh, there was a question about continuity. Did Was there art on the walls or was it just more, uh, were things tacked up for you guys to look at that? Uh... No, there wasn't art on the walls, um, but there was a file file cabinet Neil had is bursting with artwork. Um, all of his Ben Casey dailies. Um, wow. uh, it's, I mean, there's just tons of artwork there to study and look at and you could take it out and look at it and, and uh, study it. Um, you know, I watched Neil do some of his Tarzan paintings, just incredible. And you would see him in various stages of development. Uh, so you could see how he started out and where he went, what he was doing, the whole process. It was, it was, like I say, it was an amazing learning experience. Um, uh, 
not just Neil, but you know, watching all the all the artists. Um, uh, Ralph Reese was working on that Roach's job, I think, uh, when I was working there. Larry Hama was doing um, some kind of uh, uh, what was it, a martial arts job or something? Oh, it was um, it was that uh, Wolf the Barbarian for Atlas Comics. Mm -hmm. uh, that Larry was penciling. I remember um, you could just watch all of the, all of these uh, really good artists uh, as they did their page or whatever. So it was just really, really great experience. Yeah. I can't even imagine. So, um, you know, when I was looking over, you know, a lot of the, you know, the titles and things just were kind of reminiscing on stuff that you've done. I mean, there's just so many books that you've worked on and so many characters that you've worked on. Uh, you know, from Spider-Man to X-Men to, to to lots of DC characters as well. I mean, did did you have a did you ever have a, a true preference? I mean, between Marvel and DC, or a particular title over another one when they, when you're working on it that you were fond of because of the stories, or they meant something to you? I mean, in the early days, Marvel was much more fun to work with. DC was a little stuffier. Uh, you know, older editors, older artists working there. Um, it seemed to be more energy at Marvel in the be in the beginning, but then you know so many people went back and forth between Marvel and DC editors and pencilers and inkers uh, that there wasn't much difference um, later in the seventies and into the eighties. Um, I remember working on um, uh, uh, Legion of Superheroes, inking Jim Sherman. Mm -hmm. Uh, for DC, and that was really some fun stuff. Jim was doing some really interesting things with his pencils, and uh, Joe Rubenstein and I were having a good time inking him. Um, I inked a couple Aquaman jobs over uh, Don Newton that were were fun. You know, he did uh, very kind of finished pencils, but it was a, a style that left you a little room to put something in of yourself as mm -hmm. well. So he was fun to ink. Um, then I, I did a lot of my uh, early work at Marvel, uh, went over to DC later and, and uh, inked a lot of uh, Batman over Graham Nolan and Wonder Woman and, and New Titans over George Perez. Um, uh, and then eventually, you know, I was, I was working on uh, Superman penciling uh, and other people inking and I ink some of it myself. Um, so I did a lot of work actually at DC, um, but I guess most people are more familiar with my Marvel work. Probably some, I mean, even though I did the main characters at DC, I, a little more higher profile jobs at, at Marvel with, you know, GI Joe number one, I worked on and Craven's last hunt and, um, the New Mutants, of course, um, you know, just kind of things that got more attention, I guess, um, mm -hmm. that I worked on with Marvel. Yeah, someone commented earlier about your uh, your work on the G.I. Joe. I can't remember exactly what the comment was, but uh, I don't know, I have, to, I have to scroll around to find it. But, but it, you know, very memorable. Uh, there was a question about Claremont and, uh, you know, how did that relationship kind of... Uh, get you to where you start working on new mutants because I, I had Jim shooter on, on uh, Saturday as part of our weekend con. And he talked about Claremont being a big, you know, like director, you know, he picked people that he wanted to work with, even when, if, if he knew Cochran wasn't available, you know, he, he was looking at Paul Smith or, you know, he was always looking for trying to fill those voids with people that he was cherry picking to make sure his pr products were always top notch. So, I mean, do you feel the same way? And then I guess, you know, leading into that question about how did New Mutants come about? Uh, you know, where did, how did that whole arc get? Uh, where was the, where was the, uh, you know, how did it all start? Let's go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, my career as an inker took off uh, before I was able to get penciling work. Um, I started out in the humor area. So I, I had never intended to be a comic artist. So I, had a lot of catching up to do. I had to learn visual storytelling and better anatomy, uh, lighting, staging, uh, composition of all 
everything involved in, in penciling comics uh, took me a little longer to pick up than um, just inking all the various things you need to know as an inker. Uh, like when I first started out in production, Mike, Mike Esposito told me, uh, you know, you can learn to be an inker faster than you can learn to be a penciler. Uh, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll try inking. <laughs> so that's how that started. But then it's like five years before Marvel finally gave me a penciling job. And that was uh, Marvel Team Up 86 with Spider-Man and the Guardians of the Galaxy. And Chris Claremont wrote that uh, issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was the first one that I penciled for. And um, later on, uh, how much later not not too maybe a year or two later uh they needed someone to do uh, a fill-in on the x-men and i guess i was the only one around <laughs> i don't know why they chose me but jim sherman had started this x-men 151 and had to abandon the job for some reason mm -hmm. um so they needed someone to pick up where he left off and uh he had just done really basic layouts on some pages he i think he finished the first page pencils um and the rest near the end of the book was nothing so i took over and penciled that job um and inked a couple pages in the in the back and then i penciled the next issue uh x-men 152 where this white queen and storm switch bodies and um, that was a really fun job to to pencil um so I did all of that myself and evidently Chris and Louise uh, liked it. And um, they offered me the job of being regular X-Men penciler. I think uh, Dave Cockrum was, had just left the book for whatever reason and they needed somebody on the X-Men and everybody else must've been out of town. I don't know <laughs> why I was the one they offered it to, but anyway, I was very excited um, I really wanted to pencil the X-Men. And then they just said, uh, you know, and we're also, you know, doing a spinoff of the X-Men, going to be a younger team. Uh, we don't have a title for that book yet. Uh, but um, if you wanted to do that, you could be co-creator of this new series with Chris. And, you know, I really wanted to pencil the X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> and the X-Men was a known property. I knew I'd get good royalties on it. And it was a high profile. And it was fun. And this new book, we didn't know if it was going to bomb and go away after a few months or what was going to happen with it. Uh, so it was a kind of a gamble. Um, but then again, I, I was thinking, well, when are they ever going to give me another chance to be co-creator on a book with Chris, um, you know, spin off of the act? That's, I couldn't pass up that opportunity. So, you know, I reluctant, kind of reluctantly, kind of enthusiastically went with that. And uh, so what was that creative process like? Was, uh, you know, was Chris giving you these are the outlines of the characters? He, you know, start doing some sketches, give us some character designs. He um, and I uh, talked a lot over the phone. Um, he had a lot of the character, not all of them. He had some names in his, in his uh, mind kind of almost nailed down. He had their powers kind of roughly uh, nailed down before they brought me on board, but he needed me to visualize all this. And a lot of decisions had to be made, like a name for the book <laughs> and whether they'd have like school uniforms or mm -hmm. uh, individual costumes um, and what those might look like. And, um, you know, was say, was Sunspot going to be big like the Hulk when he used his powers or was he going to stay little? Um, you know, was, was Sam Guthrie going to be a big muscular guy or what was he going to look like? Mm -hmm. um, things like that. Uh, I think rain was originally going to be, um, um, like a, an Iranian character. And then he decided to make her Scottish. Um, so a lot of decision making that we discussed and, and went back and forth and I did sketches and made changes, made new sketches, um, and then, you know, we had 
I was starting on the first issue, uh, and then you know the graphic novel line was starting up at the same time, and they were looking right. for projects to turn into graphic novels. And uh, they said, uh, "Why don't we make the New Mutants into a graphic novel?" And we were excited about that. But as a comic, I was there was no deadline; it wasn't scheduled. I was going to have all the time in the world to do my very best work on the on the New Mutants first issue. And as soon as I got started on it, they decided to make it a graphic novel, which had a different schedule. It was already behind schedule. And not only that, it was twice as many pages. Um, so, you know, I had to just start working as fast as I could draw. And that was really my first penciling assignment. I mean, I had done fill in the issues on Spider-Man and other things here and there, but um, I hadn't had a regular penciling assignment until mm -hmm. that, a monthly book until that. Um, so I was still kind of working out my figure poses, you know, where am I going to put the arms and legs? How am I going to, at what angle am I going to show this from, you know, composition, all, all this stuff. I was still kind of needed time to think and I didn't have any time to think. I just didn't had give to, it to draw you. as quickly as I could draw. So that was tough. I mean, that probably I mean, wasn't as enjoyable as you had hoped it was going to be. I just, I just never felt like I was doing my best work because I was so rushed all the time. I know mm. the fans have a lot of sentimental attachment to the early New Mutant stuff, and I do too. I, you know, I like a lot of what I did on it, but I just always felt this could be so much better if I could just take my time. You know, I, I really wanted to be penciling and inking. Right. Um, and he, I did that on the graphic novel, but I was literally inking as fast as I could. Um, it could have, it, I just didn't have time to make it my best work, uh, which is why I eventually left the book. You know, I just, um, I didn't like how it looked. Uh, I thought I could do better work and I was under too much pressure on that book, unfortunately. Yeah, that's too bad. You needed your own crusty bunkers team, effectively, yeah. to, to be able to <laughs> meet those deadlines. Where you just say, "I want to do the characters, somebody else do the backgrounds." Uh, that would have been nice. Like, yeah, that would have been. <laughs> uh, well, that's too bad. I mean, was it? Uh, I mean, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was about Louise Simonson. So you know, just she, it seemed like she had such a really uh, good influence at Marvel and, uh, and nurtured a lot of uh, good projects during her time, and also you know brought in you know I think worked with a lot of creative teams. I mean, was, what was she like to work with as an editor? Louise Simonson? Yeah. Uh, she's one of my favorite people in the business. Uh, I credit her with giving me some of my uh, best jobs. Um, she was very easy to work with. Um, never gave me uh, any kind of trouble working with her it was, it was just a very easy working both of them chris and, and louise both were a pleasure to work with um i don't remember ever having to redraw much uh really a couple things um they would the graphic novel particularly in the beginning they changed my uh panel d designs i would having a lot of you know i was very influenced by neil at the time having a lot of mm -hmm. slanted panel borders uh, diagonal panel stuff and they changed them back into more traditional squares and, and rectangles I think because uh, Chris was trying to explain a lot it was the beginning of the series you know so he had a lot of exposition to get into and um, needed room for the dialogue maybe um, I don't know I remember but... that about the way it was structured too it was very traditional that, you know, the yeah. way the graphic novel was presented. And I like can show that. you my pages were not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can show you the before and after. Um, there were a lot of changes as, as far as that went um, early on. But once we got further into it, um, you know, I knew what they wanted. And uh, I, I guess I was able to give it to them because it was um, easy to work for them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, got a couple other questions here. I mean, it, it, a bit of a tangent question, but, uh, as far as pencilers that, uh, you've worked with, I mean, do you have any favorite pencilers that you worked with any particular jobs that you're most proud of? I mean, you know, other than like the most obvious ones that, uh, you know, that we can think of, but I mean, 
I mean, John Musima was always my favorite to work over because yeah. um, mo most of the time I was inking his breakdowns and they were the loosest breakdowns in the business, but he gave you everything you needed and you could just build, build and build on it. Um, do whatever. See, I would think that would be do. challenging. I, you know, that would be the, that I was thinking he would not be the one you would pick because, and maybe I haven't talked to enough uh, finishers, right? But at the end of the day, I, 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 you know, because I know exactly what the John Buscema pages look like, because there's still a lot of them out there, those rough, rough pieces. I would think that not having enough to, you know, they don't give you enough direction in their own way, because I mean, maybe the character, it, it's like you just said, the contents there, but the details aren't there. I mean, you're really kind of filling out all the all the details that John's leaving out, but that doesn't that as as a finisher that doesn't bother you didn't bother you at all. No, that's what I loved about it. Um, I mean, you got to remember, I started as an inker, and I knew what I wanted to do with rendering. I knew what I wanted to do with lighting, mm -hmm. um, and I'm a penciler myself, so I knew I knew how to draw. I didn't know how to draw comic books as well as John Buscema. So I was learning from what he was doing. But once he already had the great layout there, that was, to me, the hard part, coming up with uh, the storytelling, the layout, the figure poses, all that. He had done that for me. So then I could just take it and, and, and finish it. It was, uh, you know, not difficult for me. However, my very first color comic, uh, Kazar Number no. Seven, was mm -hmm. a Tommy a breakdown job, and uh, that came about because um, it came in at a time when everybody was busy on other projects. Uh, Vince Coletta, who was kind of the go-to guy for jobs that were uh, needed immediately, was out of town, and John Beporton was pulling his hair out trying to find somebody to ink this. Uh, breakdown job and i said john i'll take that please yeah, <laughs> please give me that job i begged him for it and he was very reluctant because i was so inexperienced uh just uh had been inking a little while but you know there was nobody else so he gave it to me and i was really in over my head um did not know what to do with these breakdowns um and so I had, uh, I was up at Continuity. I had Joe Rubenstein tighten up some of the uh, figure drawing and pencil uh, that I would ink over. I had Klaus Jansen ink a couple pages. Neil inked ahead and uh, various stuff here and there on a few pages. Um, so I let, had a lot of help um, and, you know, muddled my way through it. And it, it's a horrible job, but I got, I got through it and learned a lot doing it. Um, so then the next time I got a chance was, uh, I believe, well, I eat probably a couple covers over him in the meantime. Um, and then I got a chance to ink him on Conan, um, starting out with finished pencils. Mm -hmm. And so I inked uh, several pages of the first issue, uh, finished pencils. And then the next issue, I think he started with finished pencils and maybe he saw that I wasn't, um, I guess basically I, I, I knew what I was doing. So then he switched back to breakdowns because he could make more money doing breakdowns, you know? Um, and uh, I loved it when he switched to breakdowns because then I could just have more fun with it. So I just thought I'd take a look at some of the, uh, the Conan pieces and th that you had worked on with him. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, many, many memorable pieces. That's for sure. Yeah. That was one of the last pages that I inked over him. Um, if I, if I had these to do over again, at the time I was like, I, I said before, I was very enamored of Tom Palmer's inking and Neil Adams inking. If I had it to do over again, I would be more uh, faithful to John's own school of inking, which is more of the Hal Foster sure. uh, school, you know, more brush, more um, simplistic. Simplistic might be the wrong word, but a different kind of inking rendering that's not so cross hatchy, you know, so um, 
detailed, um, just to uh, be a little more sympathetic with what John would have liked to do, you know, instead of, at the time I was just, you know, trying to be a blend of Tom Palmer and Neil Adams. Right. Did, uh, I mean, did you ever talk with John about the projects? I mean, you, you know, where he might critique your inking a little bit or was, uh, did you, I mean, did you well, have much of a relationship with him? At the time, um, I mean, I met John up at the office, uh, not while I was inking him, but I met him up at the office and um, kind of a gruff guy. Um, I just knew him to say hello to. At, back in those days, I often never even met the penciler I was inking over. Uh -huh. um, John and I never discussed my inking on Conan. I don't know if he liked it or hated it. Um, I was just doing my thing. He was doing his thing. Um, this particular one was breakdowns and um, I just was having a good time with it. Let's see. Yeah, there's just, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of art with Go the, up to the one in the center here at the top. That's a crusty bunker job. That one. Yeah, I see that. That one's got a lot of, uh, a lot of credits on that one with you and, Neil yeah, and so, Russ and John. Wow. So obviously mostly Neil, but I did some of these mm -hmm. guys here in the uh, right side middle. Um, so like in, throughout right, here? Yeah, some of those guys. I think I might have inked um, something up here in the bottom. I don't remember exactly what, but again, little pieces here and there. That's the way that we worked on the Krusty Bunker. Just, you know, piecemeal. Mm -hmm. I mean, even on that girl, that's like 99% Neil, but I think somebody somebody else inked her foot. <laughs> <laughs> right. He was more concerned with uh, her her arms, her face. Uh, yeah, all the know, important course. stuff. Yeah. All right. I mean, because you can see, you know, in Conan's face there, I mean, that's obviously Neil. I mean, you can't, yeah. that's unmistakable. You know, yeah, both of those guys are Neil on, on yeah. the faces. Um, down here on this guy on the big panel, his striped jacket here at the bottom. Um, I think Neil started it and somebody else finished it off. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Well, at least, uh, whose calf gallery is that? Um Oh, Michael Mallet. Uh, yeah, he's, but it's, it's great that he's given many people the, the credit that uh, are deserved on this piece. Uh, what else? Uh, I'm just trying to see if I can see any more thumbnails here. Uh, this is a another title page. Not the biggest scan, but. Yeah, again, that was breakdowns. Um, mm -hmm. And I put so much work into that tree in the foreground. <laughs> um, and you know, the coloring on it was dark purple. So you'll just lost all of that. I'm right. So bummed by that. Um, but I thought I did a nice job on that page. Yeah. So what was it like when you'd see something like that where the, uh, cause coloring would have, you know, it's not like things were printed on the best paper back then. Uh, and a, a bad coloring job could just ruin, uh, you know, your all the fine work that you did. I mean, we we lament that today because a lot of people will post the you know the, the original and then they'll show, have the published piece as an image we can look at as well. And a lot of times we look at them and we're like, ugh, it just you know the coloring just ruins the the intensity. It's a shame. The, yeah, it's a know. shame. I feel like my whole career I got bad coloring. Honestly, um, I was too busy um, to do my own coloring. Um, it paid so poorly back then, you know, $10 a page, maybe to, to color a page. Mm -hmm. um, so I only colored one cover. Um, and then I, I did a full color Hulk job that I penciled ink, lettered and colored. But other than that, uh, I, I, I mostly just did either penciling or inking. I love doing tonal work like this, uh, the Savage Sword of Conan. I, I did the tones there. Um, but I, you know, I, Black and white artwork, you can see everything that we did. If you get into right. the color comics, the printing, like you say, was bad. The, the color obscured a lot of it. Um, so often the originals look so much better than the printed comic. Right. 
I always love those uh, Marvel magazines, though. I love uh, you know the the ink washes and the tones in them. I mean, it doesn't matter what it was, whether it was a horror magazine or it was Conan, it was Rampaging Hulk, right? I mean, all of those yeah, titles. Yeah, the page were, you just, just showed, the Conan page you just showed, uh -huh. was from a uh, Savage Sword where I inked only like five pages out of the issue, and they weren't even um, consecutive pages. And uh, that girl that he's with is the same girl all the way through the story, but she goes from being a blonde to a brunette. <laughs> 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 oh, that's funny. Well, I guess thankfully it wasn't, you know, I don't know. That's, that's well, that's what happens, right? When you're uh, doing things piecemeal like that. Um, so, I, uh, so, so, you know, you've got John, I mean, so you did some work with Bill Sienkiewicz, right? On Moon Knight, I believe in the Hulk magazines yeah, too. I was, I was, uh, Joe and I were the first ones to ink Bill when he started up at, uh, Marvel. He was very much trying to pencil like Neil Adams and we were trying to ink like Neil Adams. And, um, it was a lot of fun inking over Bill, um, this job, the, uh, Star-Lord job, uh, I got to do tones on again and I thought I did some really nice work on that. Um, Bill did tight pencils. Well, I mean, Bill did very sketchy pencils. Um, and I asked him, well, why don't you, you know, take it a little further and, and pencil a little tighter. Um, Cause in some places he wouldn't even hardly finish the drawing. Um, and he said, well, you know, the time it would take me to tighten up the pencils, I could just ink it myself. So he, <laughs> he kind of just did what he thought was important and left it to the inker to do the rest. And again, that's, that's what I like to do is take pencils that need some um, finishing and, um, you know, do what I like doing with them. Right. So he so gave you enough, too. That's he kind of it was John's approach is I'm going to give you what you need and then I'm going to keep working. Yeah, so really uh, sketchy pencils, but of course, you know, really wonderful pencils too. So there's a lot of Bill there and there's a lot of me there uh, together. Let's see what the, uh, a couple Hulk magazines. Yeah, let's take a look over here. So from Moon Knight. Yeah, those were great. Yeah, um, you know, Bill didn't stick around doing the uh, Neil Adams style very long, uh, but he was very good at it. Um, and so that was, you know, a lot of fun stuff. Yeah, no, that was very memorable. Um, so during that period, too, I mean, what other, uh, you know, well, well, what give us a few other, uh, you know, artists that you worked with that who's, uh, well, of course, um, Mike Zek and I started around the same Zach, time right. <clears throat> and did a lot of work together. Uh, Mike liked my inking and I liked his penciling. And he was another one that kind of did finish pencils, but he left the inker some room to also contribute. Um, so I always enjoyed inking Mike Zek's work. Um, who else? Uh, I mean, anybody that could draw is is fun to ink uh i loved inking over mike golden on howard the duck mm -hmm. um that was breakdowns um but mike's style of breakdowns was very different from john misema he would give you very nice complete contour line drawings with no rendering and no blacks um so then i could just take his drawing and um just go to town rendering it up you know um, i would think that he because his style is so is so line heavy you know you you, you can you know a uh, michael golden piece immediately so i would think that he would have to give you those extra details in order to kind of keep it feeling like at least during not that on those jobs yeah not on those jobs they no. were just breakdowns bare bones wow. um just the basic drawing mm -hmm. um i inked him on a micronauts job uh i think it was micronauts number eight maybe um, there was total finished pencils with all the blacks and rendering there. And it basically just traced it. <clears throat> there wasn't much for me to do. So didn't enjoy that job too much. <laughs> right. Right. I'm not a tracer. <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. I mean, you want to have some, 
uh, creativity in it. I mean, your, your work with Zek, of course, is I think what most people, um, I mean, I don't know, think most fondly of. I mean, the whole uh, Craven's Last Hunt, you know, to this day is probably, um, you know, many readers who even aren't art collectors, it's their their favorite Spider-Man story. I mean, as, as art collectors, everybody would kill to have a page from from that uh, story arc, right? I mean, it's uh, it's just so memorable. And the work is just fantastic. I mean, I'm looking at a bunch of thumbnails right now. And I, it's, even as thumbnails, they, you know, I've got to highlight, you know, pull it up. It's just, it's just amazing. You know, you look at these pages, and you know that, you know, know what the you know what these stories were from. I mean, just by looking at the thumbnails, these small images, but you, they're so they're things that we've seen so many times. And it, it's just it's just phenomenal how well the two of you how well together you guys worked on this because you, your styles just seem to complement each other so well at this point in your career. So this this particular page, Mike started out this series doing very very tight pencils, some of the tightest pencils he had ever done, um, and then for whatever reason, uh, ha kind of halfway through it, he started doing breakdowns. Uh, so all the lighting and rendering was up to me. Whereas in the beginning, it was it was just all there. Um, so I wanted to keep the same look, obviously, that he had established in the first couple issues. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wasn't trying to do anything uh, far from what he had done. But my style is a little different from Mike's. And um, this particular page was breakdowns that uh, that's all my rendering and lighting there. Well, it's, I love it. I mean, it works so well. The first panel was, you know, with Spidey essentially coming out of the shadows like that. I mean, he's like the hunter in that. I mean, everything, the, the whole, I'd love to, you know, I love this story. You know, it's, and I wasn't a big Spider-Man fan, but this, this was one uh, that, you know, I've read uh, probably like once a year. It's just such a, such a memorable story and the art was so great in it that, uh, yeah. And you, and you look at it today and they are really some of the most sought after, um, pieces that uh, that you've worked on i i think i mean if you if, i don't know if you follow auctions too much but uh but these pieces when they come up or when they get sold you know directly between collectors they're always you know there's a lot of interest in all of them yeah it was a great series uh obviously a wonderful story and mike did some wonderful pencils and i think it's some of my best inking so this one was finished pencils i i believe let me let me think yeah i'll go i'll, I'll zoom in sure on that more. I think that one was finished pencils. Um, but again, Mike's style is a little gives the inker some room to to you know put them some a little bit of themselves in it as well. Um, probably my idea to put Zipatone on the side of the grave there. Um, you know, he had the clouds penciled in dark with a lot of rain and the lightning there but it was like my idea not to outline the lightning um and exactly how to render the clouds um you know all that stuff um you should make decisions as you're inking yeah and I, I like that we were looking at some some rights in the other day and i was commenting on the fact that you know he's letting the ink kind of define those uh the those edge lines you don't need to have to draw them in all the time you know there you can but as a work of art i like looking at it like you know that lightning looks so much better drawn like that here in the in the ink piece and hopefully the colorist follows the <laughs> what looks obvious <laughs> right exactly yeah the the rat was fun to do um you know Breaking up the shadow, leaving some white inside the shadow, uh, always interesting. Um, and then taking a razor blade, exacto knife, uh, probably, and and streaking the rain through the right black through shadow. the black. Yeah, that's always a, I always marvel at that when I see pages where the, where the uh, the inkers done that you know for the effect where they're just taking the razor blade and scratching into the ink and you know that really mars the page up a bit you know i've seen yeah. some ramita senior pieces where he's just like gouged the gives uh, some, paper gives you some tactile feeling there um everybody a lot of people that i've talked to always assume that i inked a lot of this stuff with brush um, but i was using a really flexible pinpoint back then and 
the vast majority of, of this series was inked with a pen. Hmm. See, I would have thought it was a brush as well. So because yeah, it's very thick, thin. It is, um, yeah. But the the pinpoint was so flexible, I could get a really thin to thick line with it. No. The yeah. clouds were brush. Yeah. All the all the rain I did with brush. Really, really nice. Uh, you know, Michael uh, Rock had a question. Does the inker get paid more when they are inking from breakdowns as opposed to full pencils? We get a whopping $25 a page extra. Um, penciler would get $25 a page less. For That started in the 70s, I believe, and went on through to about 2000. Forget about inflation. It was $25 a page for three decades, I think. Wow. Well, I get so at least it was something, right? <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, and another reason I like doing breakdowns, I'd get more money for them. Um, this was another one that, um, well, let me look at this one. I, yeah, I can't zoom in on this one, unfortunately. This one might have been finished pencils. I don't remember. So, so you're. So effectively, the first couple issues when Zek was doing more finished pencils, uh, you know, he was getting paid more. But then, as the, the series went on, he went, he, he did more breakdowns, and then that uh, uh, cut into his. I mean, but do you think it was more of a scheduling thing, or, or did he just have I'm more confidence in you? I've never talked to Mike about it, or if uh -huh. I have, I've forgotten his answer. Might maybe he was starting on Secret Wars around that time. I don't, uh, I'm not sure know what else he was working on. Mm -hmm. um, but he switched to breakdowns, uh, I'm pretty sure, because he was also doing something else. Sure. Yeah, there's not a bad page in all of these, uh, in, in this <laughs> whole whole arc. Not at all. I mean, he, it's, uh, it, you know, I'm not, a, like I said, I'm not a Spider-Man fan, but I would kill to have a page from uh, from from this story. It's just, uh, it's just so memorable. I mean, and every page is just so darn good. Um, yeah, but that's interesting though. You know, I honestly thought you were going to say that you didn't get paid anymore <laughs> for breakdowns versus finished. So yeah. I, I didn't know that was really essentially a definition. I mean, how did, again, it's back. I'm curious, how do they track that inside the, the offices as far as does the, does the penciler just make a note? I'm just doing breakdowns. And so you know, that's how they know to pay them $25 a page less and, and you 25 more. Well, I would, I would assume, uh, when they, give the penciler the job he says um look i only have time to do breakdowns on this mm -hmm. or when i was doing star wars um tom palmer had been the longtime inker on star wars when i came on as penciler and he requested that i do breakdowns uh because he liked to have a strong contribution to the art um and i was i was fine with that uh I wanted, like I said, I was a big fan of his inking. I wanted to see what he would do yeah. with my layouts. Um, so it was very interesting uh, getting the pages back, seeing how he inked them as opposed to what I would have done with them. Um, but I was always wanting to pencil and ink myself. Um, and as much as I liked Tom's inking, I, I didn't, I, I, would, I wasn't really uh, satisfied just doing layouts for him uh so i ended up leaving star wars because I, I wanted to try to pencil and ink yeah that's i was just trying to look at it pull up a few pages here to look at but um but that's interesting and well and you were stating earlier that you definitely enjoyed more of that freedom to you know if you were take getting breakdowns because then you got to put more of yourself into to the work versus just tracing so yeah I and see. i never I mean, I, I think I'm a good storyteller, visual storyteller. I think um, I'm good at um, layouts, but that's it's never been where my interest was. I always wanted to control the finished look of the of the page as well as uh, the layout. So, mm -hmm. you know, I I this was I think from the first issue I did with him and you know he did that nice split lighting down the the, the big close-up at the first panel there 
I, I really loved what he did with that face. Um, and I love what he did with the, uh, the bounty hunter down in the bottom right corner there. Um, you know, so much of what he did was just really nice. The bounty hunter on the bottom left there too, the, the mm -hmm. robot type guy. Um, you know, he did so many things so well. It, it was fun to see when these pages came back. Um, so you did get to see the originals a after he was done inking them. You got to kind of look over and see see yeah. what you, well, you wanted to see, right? You wanted to see how Tom was going to. Yeah. So on this page you're showing right now, the bottom left corner there, uh, the bottom left panel, uh, the silhouette of Leia in my breakdown, I said, I suggested uh, you could do a silhouette here if you wanted to. Um, so I, I drew in you know, her belt and her costume details and everything. But I suggested that he put a silhouette there. So he kind of did a semi silhouette. Mm -hmm. But often I would kind of do some lighting. Uh, even though I was doing breakdowns, I would take a little further and finish it a little further. And he would do it totally differently. <laughs> so he didn't <laughs> feel restrained by what I was doing with the pencils as far as any kind of rendering or lighting, he would, he did what he wanted with it. Do you feel you approached most pencilers, uh, you know, approaches the same way. If, if you didn't like the lighting, you would change it. I mean, Definitely. It, yeah. 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 I mean, I had a definite idea what I wanted to do with, with inking. Um, and a lot of the pencilers I worked on, especially early in my career, didn't want to be traced. They were doing pencils, basically trying to tell the story, and they depended on the inker to add a style to it and and kind of uh, bring something to the table, not just trace over what they had in the pencils. So, right, you know, artists like Val Mayerick and Rich Buckler and um, uh, Bob Brown and uh, George Perez in the beginning. Um, I mean, all, all these artists weren't penciling in a way that they just wanted you to follow their lines. Mm -hmm. I love what Tom did with the turtle guys here in that page. Right. That first panel is amazing. <laughs> yeah. I just but. did these turtle guys and, um, you know, the breakdown, the, the, the layout and everything, but that's all him with the lighting and, and the, the texture on them. It's wonderful. That's interesting. So you didn't even do the texture. You just kind of gave him, you literally were giving him the shapes. I gave he, him the pose, you know, yeah. the, the proportions, everything. Um, all the basics, you know, I put the gun melt on the guy over his shoulder. You know, I, I do the basic drawing there, um, but all of the, the lighting uh, and the rendering is all Tom. Wow, that's brilliant. Yeah, Ian, I wish I could zoom in on the turtles. It's unfortunate. This is uh, the, as large as the scan gets, unfortunately. I'd have to shrink the screen, and I think it would just get kind of pixelated if I did that. There's bound to be a few other good examples in here. But but yeah, that's interesting, though. I mean, so you, was this uh, was this the only project that you worked on with Tom, where you got to do? No, I did a Spider-Man team up uh, with Dracula and Doctor Strange. Um, oh yeah, well actually here's a, yeah, I didn't even realize I, I was looking at, there was a page on here from, uh, yeah, that page right there. I did breakdowns, um, and he did the finishes on it. That was much later in our careers. Mm -hmm. Um, did I do anything else with him? I don't think so. Yeah, this is the only page of art that I've got on here. And there's just the, uh, well, here's another page from that Spider-Man. But it's only Star Wars and Spider-Man on here. Yeah. Team up. Yeah, I think that's it with me and him. But now, did, did you uh, get to chat with him a lot or, you know, around the offices? Or was he somebody that you didn't get to did see? Not, did not meet him, didn't know him until years later. I finally met him and, and uh, we had dinner together and talked a few times. Um Wonderful guy, uh, very nice gentleman, um, such a wonderful artist. Um, so, you know, he, he was a pleasure. Well, uh, a big uh, McFarlane collector in the audience would like to know, what was it like inking over McFarlane and Amazing Spider-Man 299? <laughs> 
you know, I inked Todd McFarlane earlier than that on a, um, what was that job? Um, uh, uh, it was a robot um, character, and I, it's, it's escaping me at the moment. Um, but I did a job. <clears throat> Todd was just starting out. His pencils were very crude and um, uh, needed a lot of help. So I really knocked myself out doing a, my very best work on that job. And then he probably liked it and uh, maybe asked for me on Spider-Man when he when he's took over the Spider-Man book. Um, and again, this was uh, early on and he was doing some very crude pencils that were really breakdowns and vouchering them as finished pencils. You know, he was getting paid finished pencils and yet they needed a lot of finishing. Uh, so I wasn't happy. Um, and so I ended up simplifying uh, a lot of his uh, pencils because I wasn't um, getting paid enough to put in all of his noodling, um, which I thought uh, was not really rendered in the right places anyway. Um, a lot of it was just decoration, I felt, rather than inking that rendering that served a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was trying to solidify the drawing, um, kind of make it a little uh more mm, structurally sound and just uh put what rendering i thought needed to be there to make it work um but i didn't put in all his little noodly lines everywhere i didn't follow whatever lighting he suggested because he was throwing in shadows that didn't make any sense to me uh, so i was doing my own blacks um I was not happy inking Todd <laughs> and he was not happy with my inking, which is why he took over the inking uh, starting with issue 300. And so he could ink all the noodling right at that yeah. point then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fine. You know, I, I said at the, you know, if he wants to ink himself, you know, go for it if he doesn't like what I'm doing, but I'm not going to, um, I mean, as much fun as this is, as, as a career, it's a job, you know, um, I was raising a family, I had bills to pay. Um, I was, I needed an income, I needed to make a certain amount of money and to put time in that I wasn't getting paid for. Uh, I, I just didn't think uh, was needed at that time. Not that I haven't done that on plenty of other jobs. I've, I've uh, God, I've spent so much time on these, <laughs> these jobs, making so little money often in, in the early days. Um, uh, but, you know, I just I just felt like for him to voucher those as finished pencils when they weren't finished uh, just kind of grated on me. Well, and maybe that worked. You know, he ended up giving us uh, his own inks and, and, you know, for that, he's really memorable. But maybe, yeah. you know, who knows, you know, what, what, what could have happened. But, uh, but yeah, well, I, I'm, it's good insight. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm trying to read through a couple other things. Uh, yeah, Rick Welch said you were criminally underpaid. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's probably true. Um, but uh, let me see. I was, uh, had a few other notes there. I mean, but you got to work with guys like, what about Frank Miller? What, what were his uh, pencils like? I mean, because you did a fair number of covers with uh with Frank and the other one I was looking at uh, through CAF and a few other reference sites out there. So, um, you know, what was it like working with that, with, with what he would give you? Well, again, uh, very early in Frank's career, uh, yeah. I think I inked Frank's first job at Marvel was a John Carter job. Mm -hmm. um, and he was very influenced by Gil Kane at the time. And um, I, Rudy Nebras and Gil Kane were the regular artists on, on John Carter at that time. So, I felt like he was trying to draw like Gil Kane, so I'd try to ink like Rudy Nebras. <laughs> so I, I was doing a lot of Rudy Nebras techniques over his uh, pencils. But again, very crude early work by Frank. Um, 
fun, interesting stuff. He was doing some really interesting things with lighting uh, that uh, uh, Rubenstein and I were very excited by. Um, no one else was doing stuff like that. Um, so I was really excited to ink Frank's uh, work. I inked him on that and a couple other early jobs where, again, you know, it wasn't stuff that you could trace. It, it needed a lot of finishing. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I, I show examples, um, plenty of times I've posted examples of his pencils and my inks. <clears throat> and I, I finished the drawing a lot of time. It was just not finished. Mm -hmm. um, not taking anything away from Frank. He was, was, you know, a couple of his very first jobs where he was also learning on the job and getting better with each issue and, and uh, developing his style. Um, but yeah, those early jobs were, um, took a lot of work. <laughs> were a lot of fun, but took a lot of work. Right, right. Those were ones where I put in way more than I got paid for. Well, I mean, yeah. The thing is, you do care, though. At the end of the day, yeah. you want you want to put something. Your name's still on the book, so you know you you got to do uh, you you got to put the, put the time in. But yeah, I, and I put effort into those uh, Todd McFarlane pages. I just didn't put effort in the same ways that Todd would have put effort in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, you inked a, a fair amount of Cockrum's work too. I mean, you know, did you ever, did you meet him? We get to talk with him a bit. Yeah, I met him. He was a great guy. Um, the first time I inked him was on X-Men 94. I know what a, what a, <laughs> what a milestone book to work on somebody with. I mean, it, sure what, didn't, it didn't feel like that at the time though, right? Well, what year was that? Was that like 1974? I think it was 74. Yeah. Well, I started in 1974. Right. I mean, how ironic is so, that? <laughs> you know, why did they give me that job? I was a beginning inker, barely knew how to ink, um, and they gave me X-Men 94. I think everybody else was out of town. I don't know. Um, not my best work. Um, I was still learning, and um, Dave did not like that job. Mm -hmm. And I don't blame him. I don't like it. I don't like that job. I like some of the things I did on it, but like I say, it was very early. Later on, I inked him on a um, uh, job where he goes back to the Savage Land uh, with the X-Men. Um, uh, forget offhand what the book it was, but um, that was... Uh yeah, why am I drawing Two a years voice? later and um, Spider Man Marvel, Marvel fanfare, Marvel, Marvel fanfare, fanfare yes, stuff. yeah, that and um, I it's I think that's some of my best work, and he did like my inking on that job. And I inked a right. few covers over him as well, um, that I thought I did a good job on. Marvel fanfare was it was well, with you guys working on it to kind of kick that runoff was nice because the the format was was different the paper was more expensive the printing you know they were, they put a lot into that and I think it just made uh, you know Dave looked great in it and uh, you know your inking worked fantastic in it too I thought I thought those to kind of kick off the, that run it was a good it was a good set of stories the covers were great right Michael Golden covers on those books yeah. I mean that yeah. yeah they they caught your eye I mean they. That was a fun time. I mean, when 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 they were spending money on 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 titles like that, just to kind of experiment and see how they would work. I mean, and that was a, that was one that worked. I thought really well. Yeah, he was fun to ink over. I always enjoyed working over him. Yep, Marvel. Uh, Rich Rill said Marvel Fanfare three. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I inked a lot of George Perez. Um, first job I did over George Perez was for those Kung Fu magazines, uh, Sons of the Tiger. And that was uh, some of George's very first work. Um, and I thought, oh, my God, this this guy is never going to. This is awful stuff. <laughs> and he got so much better so fast. Um, his work just kept getting better and better over the years. And um, I inked a lot of him later on with, uh, say, in the Wonder Woman and New Titans. Um, and I always enjoyed uh, inking George because... I felt uh, he gave me good layouts that I could make look good. And anytime I worked on something where I thought I could do a good job on it, I, I was very happy. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, I was going to ask you about Perez too, because you know I always feel like he would be a challenge to ink, but you got to ink him early on when he was still figuring things out. Well, I often inked him over breakdowns. Okay. Um, the, the early Kung Fu job was finished pencils, but God, that was, that was some rough stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even know if we have any of that kind of stuff on cast. Just I'm as sure. well. Just to, you don't you don't need to see that. <laughs> we don't. Okay, we don't want to look it up. All right, we'll stay away, steer away from that. But you did some uh, Avengers work with him too, and that was a cover that I did yeah. over him. That was finished pencils. Um, but again, his his pencils were not meant to be traced, so you know I I could take over if I wanted to. See, that's interesting. I would think George's pencils uh, would be hard to not to to give you the freedom to kind of do different things. I would think you'd almost have to follow his intentions. I almost always inked breakdowns over George. So yeah. when I inked his finished pencils. Um, from what I remember, uh, yeah, that was breakdowns. Uh, his finished pencils gave you room to to add some stuff. Yeah, so all the lighting and rendering, there is me. See, that's things you don't think about, you know, as a reader, and it's, and even as an art collector, right? You don't you don't really, uh, you know, get that kind of insight. You always think it's the original intent, or there was some collaboration. But you, you know, you got direction to do the things that you did. But uh, yeah, we never talked. You know, I <laughs> we never so uh, he never said Bob do this or you know whatever. We we he was just doing his breakdowns, and I was doing my inking. Wow, that's it, that's amazing. It's it really <laughs> is amazing. Oh, and this is in Marcus's collection. Wow, Marcus, I I didn't even know you had this page. That's great. But that's uh, but yeah, that's funny. That's not uh, that's not the, the the way I think about. You know, when I think about comics, I, I'm thinking it's like you know, you're you're talking, you you know, you're you're having you know, in depth conversations about how you want things to look. Not uh, you know, when you're working from breakdowns, I I just I still didn't think that there was that much uh, room there for. Are, there are you know, teams. Creativity. There are are teams who work that way where they talk to each other a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But I. There was nobody that I ever worked with uh, where that was the case. Like I said, most of the time I didn't even know the penciler, didn't have any contact at all. Uh, the closest I would guess I ever came to that was working with Mike Zek. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I inked some pages up. At, I visited him at his house one time and inked some pages while I was there. Um, but again, he... He let me do whatever I wanted with the inks. It wasn't like he was telling me ink this this way. You know, he just sure he did his pencils and I did my inks. Oh, well, that's that's nice. You know, I, I I pulled this. I showed it to everybody earlier, but I still have my copy of Superhero ABC. Very nice. Yeah. In my, addressed to my son, of course. My it's my <laughs> book now. My son doesn't get it, but but you you signed it for my son i bought it I, I know when these came out it was like 06 right i picked it up at a con from you I was, yeah i thought it was great and i've i've kept it kept it close ever since because my daughter's uh you know younger than my son they've they loved it when we were talking about books to bring and keep out on the shelf that was one of the ones when i because i just i just moved they were said they said that one we still want to have out because they they just remember it really fondly yeah, very nice yeah i did that at a time when my marvel and dc work was really slow very hard to to get work at that period so um i was looking around what else can i do and i had always wanted to do a children's book um mm -hmm. so <clears throat> my wife actually uh said well you know so much about superheroes why don't you do a superhero alphabet book and i said wow that's a great idea why didn't i think of that <laughs> and so i started coming up with some characters and uh, uh i like alliteration so i started writing some what I thought was funny stuff to go along with them. And, um, you know, I'd never written anything before. I wasn't a writer. Um, I don't know why I thought I could write that book instead of just doing the art for it. But um, uh, for whatever reason, I'm, uh, I started just doing both and um, found a publisher, Harper Collins, a very nice publisher, found it and offered to publish it uh and it's done very well you know it's still in print after all these years right it's amazing yeah no i still see it around i mean i i have always been that's great 
because a lot of those projects, you know, they're one and done, and you, and you, you never see them again unless you see it on somebody else's shelf. And it's not. so nice because it was, it, you know, it goes to a different audience. Uh, mm -hmm. The people that bought that book were not necessarily comic fans, even though a lot of comic fans did buy it. Um, and I tried to write it in a way that my comic fans would enjoy. Um, you know, I did things like Laughing Lass, and it obviously right. a, a reference to a, a Legion of Superheroes type character. Exactly. Um, so I tried to do things that the comic fans would get a kick out of, and yet the regular people that didn't read comics would enjoy as well. Um, so it brought in a new audience for my work that um, so often I'll be at a, a, at a comic con and people say, oh my gosh, I, my kids had that when they were little, or I read that when I was little, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, no, I agree. I, you know, I was just going to grab a link because I know you have uh, art for sale up on the on that M mbartist.com website. Yeah. Is that okay if I share that link in the chat for people? Yeah, that's my website. Um, well, there is an MB Artist uh, site, but then my bobmcleod.com right. site is also run kind of ties by, over uh, to that too. Yep. Yeah. Well, some people were asking, you know, if you've kept any art or you still have art for sale. So I wanted to make sure they they could see where they could buy art uh, from you. And uh, and yeah, I should put the Bob McLeod address in there as well. I had that. Yeah, there's a lot of art for sale on my bobmcleod.com website, mm -hmm. and I do have art still in my possession that i'll eventually sell i'm kind of not ready to sell it quite yet yeah somebody was asking about you know things that you kept because you you know you really love the work that you did and, I, and there's got to be stuff like that I, it seems like every creator that i talk to there's there's just pieces that they wanted to hold on to because you were so proud of the work that you did i mean there's got to be i mean do, do, you, do you do you find them from any particular point in your career that uh, that those pages were you've you've held on to or I mean, is it mainly what i held on to was pages that i penciled and inked so yeah. if i only did inking i usually sold it um even though i loved a lot of what i did often mm -hmm. i just wasn't as attached to it if i didn't do the pencils and the inks sure um so i do have some pages that i only did inking on uh but then again, when I do the pencils and inks, I would have I would get back the entire book of originals. Uh, so when I've got the entire book, it's kind of hard to sell a single page, you know. Right. Um, well, you know, buying it, you know, that's the thing these days is collecting complete books. I mean, they like to a lot of art reps when they sell, uh, they don't break the books up; they sell them uh, together. I, I, it's something that it's become yeah, then, a, it was always kind of a thing, but it's become a real thing. You know, that a lot of people are. Yeah, but then I've I never had one. I don't know how to price them, and I've I've sold entire issues in the past that yeah. um, you know people have resold for ten times as much. So uh, I wish I had hung on to them, and um, I wish I'd kept so much of my art. I'd I'd be a millionaire now, but you know we didn't know that art was going to be worth anything back then. <laughs> right. Of course not. Uh, no. I mean, yeah. trust so me, we, we, as collectors, we all regret not buying that art 20 and 30 exactly. years ago. So. Yeah. I could, have, I could have bought a Frazetta painting back when they were affordable, but no. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, but um, I've kept some things uh, just because uh, they keep going up in value. Some Good. of those Star Wars, Tom Palmer pages, um, Star Wars is always going to be valuable. And Absolutely. I'm also attached to them just because I like the way they look. So mm -hmm. who knows? I don't blame you. Yeah. I mean, and and when it comes time to sell them, I would, you know, if you probably noticed, a lot of uh, artists have been, you know, from your era and maybe even a little, little uh, younger have been, you know, like using heritage to sell stuff lately. They've, you know, the things that they had held on for 20 years or something and, and they're doing really well. Right. I mean, Al Milgram has given a lot of his stuff to heritage and they kind of auction it off every during their weekly. And sometimes a piece goes into the signature. And so it, it's kind of worked out well that, you know, now that that's kind of like their retirement, right. They're able to, to have that money coming in and, and realize true market value for their, for their stuff versus trying to, guess because in today's market it's so tough to price anything i mean everybody's having a problem with it because it's yeah it, it's changed so dramatically since the pandemic rolled in you know we were all we were all fearful that the prices were going to drop you know you can't go to cons you got you don't have that exposure to sell artwork and and the exact opposite happened everything doubled tripled quadrupled and it was nothing that nothing like what we expected but 
I think we all are, we're all, we all have that problem today. What is the value of, of that piece of art? Yeah. So a lot of people keep asking me if, if certain pages are available and I just, I'm so reluctant to sell them because I don't know what to ask for them. And right. um, I did, I did sell some stuff through heritage a couple of years ago, just to see, to test the waters, you know, to see how they would do. And they did very well. So I was very happy with that. Um, but, you know, when you sell through Heritage, they take a percentage. Um, and uh, I'd rather just sell them directly if I can. But um, luckily right now, um, I don't have a need financially to sell my art. So I'm just kind of hanging on to it for the time being. I do not blame you at all. I mean, that would be my recommendation is hold on to it until you, you know, until then, and, you know, and then you need to make a new addition. You're, you're going to, you know, I, I, on the house or something, I, I wouldn't worry about it. I think that that's the one thing, even from talking to younger artists today, you know, ha, seem to have like a plan. You know, I talked to Sean Gordon Murphy and he's like, well, you know, when we get a book, I, I kind of segmented into, you know, into quarters. And these are the ones, you know, these are the ones I'm going to set aside for later. And, you know, that's he kind of goes into it with that kind of a game plan, knowing that somewhere down the line, you know, when he wants to retire or whatever, that he's going to have a stockpile of art to fall back on. And it's, you know, but who would have thought that it's not like you, you don't go into these uh, the this in most most jobs where you don't have a have a retirement or, or whatnot. There's nobody there to coach you on what would be the best thing to do. You know, that's, yeah, when we were coming that's along, the part. guys in my generation were coming along, there was not this big fan art market um right in fact early on they were throwing the art away you know dc and and marvel uh uh neil adams caught DP, dc people just throwing them in the garbage can he said hey i'll take that you know yeah. and so neil's responsible really for us getting our artwork back at all they weren't giving it back uh, until that day um and so you know, they're, they're, we didn't know that the art had value or that it was certainly going to have great value in the decades to come. We didn't, we just didn't think, we just didn't realize. Um, uh, and now these artists do have that advantage. They know that there's a big art market out there so they can. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of started with the image guys, you know, they started designing their pages as pinups because they knew pinups sold well in the original art market. Right. Um, but we didn't we never thought that way when we were drawing comics. We were trying to tell a good story. Um, so it, everything this business has changed so much over the decades. It certainly has. I mean, I, I've only been a collector for 20 years and it's changed so much since I got started in it. Things yeah. are so much simpler when we <laughs> back then. But uh, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. But yeah, don't. Uh, yeah, hold on to those pieces. That's my advice. And I'm an art collector, and I'm telling you to hold on to them. <laughs> don't, right. don't let them go. Um, right. Yeah, your family will appreciate the fact that you've held on to them. That's for sure. Um, you know, it's we've already crossed the two hour mark, so you, or you're almost at two hours because it's I've been at it since uh, since nine. But uh, you know, one one thing, and, and I I don't know much about this. So I, when I was reading through a few things, I came across it. But Michael Rook was curious if you had talked about. Uh, your book inking before and after because uh, you know i feel like you know you have done a, a few things out there where you're trying to be you know do educational stuff and uh you know that not a lot of uh, creators do but you know you want to talk a little bit about that because i'm not familiar with it yeah that's a book i did to um kind of educate the fans on you know there's that joke in the in the movie that inkers are tracers you know um so I, I wanted to show people that yes, sometimes tracing is involved in inking, uh, but if if it was just tracing, anybody would do it, you know. Um, and even when you are tracing, it's it's skillful tracing. You're tracing in it with uh, a knowledge of what you're doing uh, as an artist. Uh, you're just not blindly following a line. Um, but the the inking before and after, which I would just show. Most of it is breakdowns, but there's some finished pencils in there as well. Um, it would show exactly what the penciler gave the inker and exactly what the inker did with it. Mm -hmm. And most of what's in there is my inking because that's what I have uh, copies of to use. But I did 
put some pages in with Tom Palmer inking over my Star Wars breakdowns um, and a couple other things. Uh, so it's just basically not teaching, but just showing this is what the penciler does. This is what the inker does. Um, but I have uh, taught as well. I, I was teaching at a local art college, the Pennsylvania College of Art and Design for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, teaching comic art and perspective and um, figure in motion and different different things. Uh, I like teaching. Um, I've done private correspondence uh, lessons. Um, I still offer, you know, private art lessons if anybody wants to to take one. Um, they can get in touch with me through my website. Um, but um, you know, teaching takes time. Uh, so I ended up quitting teaching to have a little bit more time for my artwork. Um, I've got another book. Uh, do I have it handy? No. I've got a book uh, teaching uh, basically the art of visual storytelling. Uh, and it's a, it's a teaching book, teaching you basically how to tell a story visually, penciling. And everybody wants me to do an inking book, you know, but inking has changed so much uh, from when the highlight of my career to, to present day uh, that um, that would be a very complicated book. It very had to put a lot of time into writing that book, whereas mm -hmm. storytelling hasn't changed. Uh, the, you know, camera angles figure poses, all that stuff, um, everything involved with penciling a comic book uh, hasn't really changed if you're doing it well. Uh, so I just did a, a little booklet on that. Interesting. I, yeah, I just pulled up the uh, the uh, the inking before and after book up on your site. So, Oh, that's on my site as well. The one I'm talking about is called uh, The Hows and Whys. I think. Oh, yeah. Yep. I see that one too. Okay. Awesome. I want to highlight that one too. Um, well, no, that's, that's, well, that, that's great. And so, well, okay. So one question was, it sounds to me like you've maybe before you ink a page, do you like photocopy them or something? Do you, do you keep a record of not only the, the pencilers work that you're doing, but the one, when you've penciled something for Tom, did you, you know, photo, you know, photocopy those as well, just so you have it as a reference for later or, yeah, I actually you... got the idea from Joe Rubenstein early on in my career. Um, I don't think Joe necessarily did it that much, but mm -hmm. um, I started not the not my very early jobs. I wish I had uh, Xeroxes of them, but pretty early on, um, I started making Xerox copies of every page. Uh, when I got the pencils, I would Xerox all the pencils. And then after I inked them, I would Xerox all the inks. So I had copies of pretty much my whole career mm -hmm. um, that I'm currently trying to make digital copies of. So a lot of it I still have left to scan in. <laughs> <laughs> but a large majority of especially the uh, more important jobs uh, I've already got digital copies of. And like I say, I've posted them online. I, I, do, I have a Patreon page where I... Uh, show samples every day of, of pencils and inks on my Patreon page. All right. Well, I've got to, I'm going to, I've got to get all these links into the show description so that people can follow through to them. I didn't know you had a Patreon page. I don't know. I, I don't know why, but I, I, do, and I, I wish more people knew I had one. I don't uh, advertise it as much as I should. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I have, a, I've had a Patreon page for a couple of years now. I think we're going to get a few more people to know about it after the show. I'm going to, I will get it linked in there and now, and we've mentioned it now. So that's okay. I found it. So I will get the link into the show description. Um, let's see what else. So uh, before we go, somebody asked, art you collect? I mean, you have some art on the walls behind you. It looks like strip art. I mean, uh, who's, uh, whose work is on the wall and uh, who's, whose work do you, uh, do you, do you enjoy enough to actually collect and own a few pieces of your, you know, yeah, I, I like the old newspaper strip artists. Uh, I don't generally hang up my own work. I hang up artists that inspire me. So I've got um, right behind me here is a Steve Canyon page by Mel Kniff. 
Ooh, yeah. There's a Rick Kirby page right there um, that uh, I think probably penciled by Gray Morrow and inked by John Prentice. Wow. Um, I've got, oh, but you can't see them. I've got some Neil Adams pages over there. I've got a Jean Giraud page right here, a Frank Fazetta there. Um, Do you have a Mobius piece on the wall? Yeah, it's a wonderful piece. Um, it's three cowboys that he not a Mobius. It's it's more of his, uh, his John Gerard, style yeah. cowboys. Mm -hmm. Those are gorgeous. Um, that I got it from Mike Zek. I traded a page of original art to Mike for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the poster's not worth much, but the original art was probably worth a few hundred dollars. But I really wanted this poster, uh, and I look at it every every day. It's it's really inspiring. Wow, I would never guess. Leonard Starr, Mary Perkins on stage page. Uh, I've got a lot of Stan Drake originals. Uh, we've mm -hmm. got a Mort Drucker page right over there. Let me see if you can, where would Mort be? Right over there is a Mort Drucker page. Um, you know, just uh, different, different things that inspire me. That's great. I mean, I, mean, I, I I don't know. I've been collecting strip art uh, just for the, like the last year and a half. So I finally got my first Milton Kniff. Um, there's a few other people I need to get uh, that I'd really like to get, but I've, I, I really like, uh, 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 gosh, who was Alex Raymond. Here. Well, I'd love to get an Alex Raymond, uh, but uh, Al Williamson pieces. Uh, yeah. There's, there's, there's several people who I need to, who are on my list. And th but they always go for a little bit more than I want to spend. That's that's I was the problem. Lucky yeah. enough to, I was lucky enough to meet uh, Al Williamson and visit him in his home, and he gave me one of his Secret Agent X Nine pages. Oh strips. man, that's yeah. That okay. Well, you know, it's it's good and to I have did, those friends. <laughs> I I did him a a drawing in return of of John Carter of Mars uh, that I did just for him. Um, only if few years before he passed away oh man wow um well you know i'm gonna i think we should probably call it a night i think you need you should probably take we could do another one of these bob i i, I have a feeling like there's a lot more that we could talk about um, it is getting late yeah. it is getting late and you are you you definitely need some rest but before we, when we're going to sign out hang out hang out for a few minutes i wanted to ask you a question after we're done here but um but I, I sincerely appreciate this. And I really would, you know, if, if we have uh, time in the future, I'd love to, to do another one. I think there's a lot of interest, uh, you know, for people. And we, we probably could get a lot more questions and, uh, you know, about your career, because I don't think we really, we really only touched on a few few things and a few artists. But uh, but I, I really enjoyed getting to chat with you tonight. I'm glad you could make it, too. Yeah, me too. I apologize for coming in late. It's not a, not a problem at all. So yeah, Jeff Wedding just said, thanks, Bob. Please come back. So there you go. We'd like to have you back on the show. And thanks, we need, and, yeah, and Michael says we need Michael. to do a part two. <laughs> uh, all right. So listen, everybody, I do appreciate it. Thanks for staying with us a little bit longer than usual. But, uh, you know, we'll be back at it again tomorrow night. And hopefully we will have Bob back on sometime in the uh, in the near future. So have a good evening. And we'll